Thank you all for joining us today for the 2019 Nakshatra Summit. We have an esteemed panel of Vedic astrologers from all over the world. My name is Shanati. I studied with Dr. Vasant Lad, Simon Chikoisky, Mahadeep Levine, and now I work on my own organization on YouTube and jyotishastrology.org and uh, Shanati Jyotish YouTube. And I am constantly putting forth new research uh, in the areas of nakshatras and uh, different areas. So thank you for letting me host this uh, amazing summit of esteemed guests. The first guest, which I would like to introduce, is Ronnie Gale Dreyer. Ronnie is an internationally known astrological consultant, lecturer, and teacher specializing based in New York City. She is one of the pioneers in making Vedic astrology accessible to Western audiences through her first book, Indian Astrology, and her appearances at conference and astrology groups throughout the world. Ronnie continues to travel, but also reaches clients and students throughout the world through the magic of webinars and social media. She has also written many books, including Vedic Astrology and Venus, articles, columns, and book reviews. She is co-author with Nicholas Campion's Indian Astrology uh, in the Anthology of the Religious Transformation in Modern Asia. She learned Jyotish and palmistry in Benares, India, where she studied privately with Dr. Moralil Sharma, a mathematics professor at Sampurnanand Sanskrit University. Rani holds an MA in South Asian Languages and Cultures from Columbia University, where she studied Sanskrit. Her thesis was a translation and analysis of five, staffers, five chapters of Strijataka, Women's Astrology. For her schedule, contact to sign up for her monthly newsletter. Go to RonnieDryer.com. Namaste, Ronnie. It's so Namaste. good to have you today. Thank you for inviting me. Next, I would like to introduce Sunili Jani Pawa. For Sunili, Jyotish is her breath and inherited from her grandpa. Sunili learned and earned Jyotish Pusha and Jyotish Panzit title from Jyotir Vidya Prabodini School of Jyotish in Mumbai. She also learned deep wisdom from her uncle, Sri Bhagyesh Traveji, and many teachers and masters like Sri A.V. Sundaramji Pantanguruji. She studies all forms of Jyotish, including Jaimini and Nadi astrology. She has taken webinars of Navamsha and Dasamsha Kundali for Planet to Soul, as well as for other channels. Sunili currently practices at her hometown in Mumbai, India, and also teaches online and offline. She is writing a book on Navamsa Rishaya, which she will publish in the future. Please contact Sunili Jani Power at her website, www.planet2soul.com. Namaste, Sunili. So good to have you here. Namaste. Thank you very much for welcoming and hello to everyone. Next, it is with deep respect I am able to introduce Sam Sadasiva Jeppy, who is joining us from San Diego, California. Sadasiva is the founder of the American Academy of Vedic Art and Science, which offers levels one to three certification programs in Vedic astrology. Sadasiva is also known for many amazing books, including Yoga and Vedic Astrology and The Ascendance, 108 Planets of Vedic Astrology. Sadasiva is always doing thorough and comprehensive analysis of current events and all the significant transits which are being consistently released on his YouTube channel. Sadasiva's writings and lectures are incredibly profound, poignant, and speak directly to the core of the karmic situation. He had recently had released his own forecast on significant, significant 2019 transits, which can be found at 2019vedicastrology.com. But Sadis ebooks can be reached through his website through VedicArtAndScience.com. Welcome, brother Sadis Eva. Namaste. Thank you. Nice introduction. You wrote half of that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's great to be with everybody again. Next, I'm deeply grateful to introduce Dr. Arjun Pai joining us from Mumbai, India. Dr. Pai is a founding member of the astrological team and organization Cosmic Insights and is well known for his research and discourses on the various nakshatra. Dr. Pai is very humble and can be reached through his website cosmicinsightshop.com 
Welcome, Brother Dr. Pai. It's good to have you here, brother. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Finally, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dayananda, also known as Dr. Dennis Harness, joining us from lovely Sedona, Arizona. Dayananda is a founding member of the American Council of Vedic Astrology and is the writer of the quintessential Nakshatra book titled The Nakshatras, The Lunar Mansions of Vedic Astrology. Dr. Harness is also founder and organizer of the Divine Sedona Vedic Astrology Conference, which will be held uh, this year, November 25th to, uh, I mean, 21st to the 25th, 2019, and is the experience of the lifetime. So get your tickets now. Dayananda can be reached through his website, DennisHarness.com. Welcome, Brother Dennis Harness. Namaste. It's great to be in this esteemed panel. Thank you all for getting to know each other through the introductions. That was very fun, very exciting. So the first question getting into the actual summit, as we dive into the history of these ancient Vedic nakshatras, I would like to have Sunili to start us off. So I'm gonna mute everybody. <laughs> I'm gonna mute everybody else. But Sunili G, the first question is I have for you. Okay. Sunili Ji, I would like you to start the summit off by discussing the concept of nakshatra and planetary relationships. How does the nakshatra operate in terms of friendly, neutral, or enemy relationship with its ruling planet and planets that are traveling within that nakshatra? Namaste, everyone. And once again, thank you, Shanati, for giving me the opportunity to just make the, you know, opening or starting the session. Basically, uh, nakshatras are uh, steady stars because they have their own light. They are not depend on other stars to give them light. That is called as Swayam Prakashya. Means they have their own lives. These nakshatras, there are different mythologies as per different uh, Puranas, as per different scriptures, or different uh, as per different sages also. That all these nakshatras, they are the you know tarka punj. They are called as, or they are they are placed in such a manner that they uh, resembles or they denote a certain shape in the sky okay now how these 27 nakshatras were formed it is not uh, a thumb rule that there are only 27 or 28 nakshatras including abhijit nakshatra as we all know we have learned that there are many more nakshatras apart from all these nakshatras there are many more stars apart from all seven stars and all other celestial stars what we know but which are unknown, but they are directly or indirectly affecting on our own, uh, you know, our own life cycle. Say now, in uh, Nakshatra Vidya, it is mentioned that our Prithvi Lok, that is Earth, is ruled by Chitra Nakshatra. Because Chitra is the middle Nakshatra of all Nakshatras. Okay, So, the Earth is ruled by Mars. That is why we always correlate Mars with the Bhumi, Mars with the Earth, because it is ruled by the Chitra Nakshatra. Now, if we have to correlate all these Nakshatras, so it is said that when the Devatas and Demons were in a battle, that time the Demons cut off the head of uh, uh, Devata, so it was a Jeshta Nakshatra. See, different, uh, in different books, different stories are written. And in, this, uh, in the space, in the Akash Mandal, when this war was taking place, and at particular time, near particular star, when this Vada or when this, uh, what you can say, that this killing took place, that time the star which was there is called as Jeshta Nakshatra. That is why Jeshta star name was given to this nakshatra same way in anuradha nakshatra the uh, asuras uh, were again overpowering the deities 
it is said like that and then with the help of uh, uh, purva shada and uttara shada nakshatra the all these demons were coming to an end because the deities got uh, you know uh, again the re uh, regenerating or re uh, the energy was gained by the deities because of certain stars in the sky like shatatarka nakshatra were all hundred types of vanaspati or you can say ayurvedic uh, plants were there and all were uh, again the new life was given to these deities so there are different stories behind all these nakshatras but if we correlate these nakshatras with the planets then we always say that these nakshatras are uh, divided into 13 degree 20 Uh, kala what we say so each nakshatra uh, has a four charan and all the planets are uh, uh, divided into this nakshatras basically all these 27 nakshatras were coming in the way of moon while they were traveling in the akashmandal that is in the sky walk that time that is why all these 27 nakshatras were given to moon so that whenever any particular planet will pass over this nakshatra then that particular nakshatra will be the lord of that planet if we if the moon is passing near particular nakshatra so we are, it is said that we are born in this particular nakshatra but at the same time maybe our other planets like mercury venus may be passing from some other nakshatra so nakshatras are called as the house of the planets or nakshatras are called as the temples there are they are the temples of grahas okay so that they are taking rest over there but each nakshatra have different characteristic they have different nature and uh, different presentation of themselves some may, some nakshatras may be very beautiful like swati nakshatra or chitra nakshatra but while giving the fruit they are very penetrating uh, fruit giver they have positive side as well as negative sides within uh, them so how we correlate the nakshatra or friend so same way how the we are correlating the planets with each other like friendly nakshatra or enemy nakshatra or neutral uh, nakshatra like that only we say that it is a uh, friendly planet to us like say sun and moon are friends to each other so same way sun nakshatra that is all uttara nakshatras uttara shada uttara falguni okay so and krutika nakshatra so they are friend to moon nakshatras so if your most of the planets are posited in the friendly nakshatras no doubt whatever nakshatra they are then definitely your life cycle will be much better and with less hurdles or less struggles same way if you are born with a moon in a say uh, in a particular nakshatra of saturn like anuradha nakshatra so anuradha nakshatra is a very uh, penetrating nakshatra or you can say anuradha is very uh, uh, like this anuradha nakshatra will make the person to think more about why i am born on this earth because it is falling in the eighth zodiac of the rashi chakra that is scorpio which is already a moksha rashi which is a moksha zodiac so anuradha born people are more curious towards the spirituality but they are not able to gain it because the moon is of anuradha nakshatra so they are not compatible with each other that is why we say that moon and saturn combination is always going towards the sanyasa or liberation these people are very virakt or you can say detached people and that is why they do not have much interest in the material life but in the same case if moon is of saturn nakshatra but if that persons other planets are of purva shada nakshatra of venus nakshatra which is a very moist nakshatra okay or mercury in the purva shada nakshatra so again the person is in the uh, uh, middle of the things let like whether i should go for the material life or whether i should go for the spiritual journey and that is why the friendly nakshatras 
and animity nakshatras or neutral nakshatras with planets plays very very important role while assessing the chart also we all have particular impact of nakshatras on our nature on our voice on our body because the whole human body from head to toe is divided into 27 nakshatras basically it is a body of daksha prajapati or prajapati so all 27 nakshatras divided into one body same way when we are born we are, all the nakshatras is is divided into us also and whatever nakshatra is very strong in our chart planet wise also and nakshatra wise also no doubt in uh, as per the divisional charts also we have to assess the strength of the particular nakshatra and particular planet so we have the characteristic of that nakshatra in us more if i am born in rahu nakshatra but if my mars nakshatra is very dominant in my chart or mars is posited in the middle of the chart or in the kendra center house then definitely my mars nakshatra is getting or my mars is getting boost up of no doubt if it is placed in any me nakshatra also if it is placed in uh, anuradha or any saturn nakshatra also but still this mars is getting the boosting from that particular nakshatra because of the placement of that planets in a particular house in the chart so we have to correlate the nakshatras and we have uh, we you now whatever we are behaving whatever we are talking or whatever is our life pattern this totally totally depends on our ascendant nakshatra and our moon nakshatra but two more minutes yeah, i'll just take yeah i i was about to tell that just let me know when the 10 minutes get over because i'll go on speaking i just want to say the last thing that each house whatever planets are positioned in your chart in particular nakshatra that house karakatva that house signification will be according to that nakshatra characteristic and planet characteristic and we have to correlate that that's it thank you shanati thank you i'm going to unmute everybody in the panel and open it up to the rest of the panel for discussion so i would like to um open up to the rest of the panel if there's any comments insights or perspectives on not the idea of nakshatra and planetary relationship you know uh whether considering ruling planets of nakshatra or planets traveling within a certain nakshatra how how, how do we look at planetary relationship any comments on that sadasiva yeah. yeah it's fantastic and um uh, certainly g pointed to some of the most important things the way i work and the way i try to break down and make it so that people can use nakshatras and make it so it's manageable and not just 27 random things and all these deities and how in the world do you bring it into something useful and practical that people can understand and one of the main things that i align or that i focus my students on is noticing things like when you'll see the one planet ruling a bunch of nakshatras um and again when we say ruling we're talking about through vimshotri dasha because actually the planets are ruled by deities but they're activated and triggered in vimshotri dasha if that's the dasha si a, a system that we're using but you'll see that in certain dasha cycles if a planet rules a lot of nakshatras that are connected to the vimshotri scheme like that you'll see a lot of energy pop out for example it was mentioned earlier before we started talking about i have a um scorpio energy <clears throat> you know which is obviously ruled by mars but one of the things is i have a disproportionate number of planets in mars nakshatras i have i have mrigashira ascendant mercury and venus and i also have venus in or i'm sorry i also have saturn in um in a uh, danishta so there's a lot of mars energy that you wouldn't maybe account for with all of the if you just look at the rashi so i don't have anything in mars signs but mars as the ruler of all of those nakshatras um you know can show it so this is one of the things i tell my students is to really notice if there's like a sort of disproportionate number and you often see it in almost every chart there will be one nakshatra there'll be one 
group, there'll be one nakshatra ruler that rules more planets than you might imagine. And this is why that person has that, that sort of outlandish nature or something. You'll often see with astrology students and astrologers, it'll be Rahu. You might not notice otherwise, like why is this person so interested in this kind of thing? And then you'll look and they have like five planets and Rahu ruled nakshatras. And you're like, ah, that's why they're so Rahu-like. So I just wanted to uh, reflect that back. And I also love the term Akashmando because that's actually what the nakshatras are. They're actually measuring the space. And again, they have stars in the space. And, and especially because we can see the stars, we tend to focus on the stars, but the original portions were actually the space. The Akash is the planets are moving. The zodiac is Akash, measured 27 ways with nakshatras and then measured 12 ways with rashis. But anyway, I love the term Akash Mandal. So thank you. Wonderful, wonderful presentation. Yeah, yeah I'll just add uh, two more points here. Your ascendant nakshatra and 12th lord. Okay, they are very much connected to each other because you come from the 12th house only. Then you enter into first house. It is not like first, second. You are first in the 12th house and then you enter into ascendant. So 12th house is Akash. That is why we call it as a sky. And second thing, as you talked about Jyotish and Rahu, so I would like to add here that each of us... Uh, for 99% cases I have seen, whoever I have met till now, they have started their astrological or occult study in Rahu, Ketu, Jupiter, or Earth Lord, uh, Mahadasha, or Antardasha. Definitely, whenever you started this, some or other way, Antardasha or Mahadasha will be of this Rahu, Ketu, Jupiter, or Earth Lord will be 100% connected. Most of the cases you received. Muted. Yeah, Rahu more than others, I would say. I totally agree. Ra that's why I mentioned Rahu in astrology, especially. And I and I think there are different occult um um, indicators, but certainly Rahu with astrology, as I've seen, as as you're also stating. Um, yeah, that's why I say, watch out when that Rahu comes. You might get, you might meet some wacky astrologer, and before you know it, your whole life is like, ah, <laughs> what's going on? So Rahu is a great thing to do with that energy. Rahu and Ketu for sure. It's better than like, you know, going and getting high on drugs and alcohol. It's it's better to get high on metaphysical, cosmic, you know. You know, because we're trying to be um, unembodied. See, because the nodes are the part of us that aren't embodied. The nodes are the part of us that exist in those interdimensional realms. So it's better if we're running the dasha of that interdimensionality that we study interdimensionality, which is astrology, <laughs> rather than try to connect to interdimensionality through drugs and unhealthy ways. And you'll see a person that has a lot of planets in those Rahu nakshatras and whatnot, or very prominent Rahu. I also happen to have it in the first house with a bunch, with all those planets. So there's always been that kind of awareness of the interdimensionality. And until I found something like astrology that gave it a structure, it was just it was just a kind of confusing, ungrounded thing. So this is why Rahu almost more than the others. <laughs> Yeah, the reason I, one of the reasons I considered this for a topic, and I was immediately happy when Sunili had chosen it as a topic, is when we look at planetary dignity in Jyotish, we think of a planet in a Rashi. So there's a certain level of planetary dignity, which is a planet in a Rashi. But there is a whole other layer of planetary dignity, which is a Graha in a Nakshatra. And see, sometimes the traditional planetary dignity where a planet might not be looking so good because of the sign that it's in, but if it's in its own nakshatra and it's its atmakarika, it's going to cancel out some of those debilitation factors. So when we, my, one of my hopes is when we consider planetary dignity, that you also look at the planet and the, nakshatra, and the ruler of the that planet from a nakshatra perspective. So 
you may have a debilitated uh, sun, but if it's in a sun nakshatra, that could be very beneficial or auspicious. So there are these types of connections between the nakshatra and the nakshatra lord that, that I like to um, be part of the c communication, part of the conversation when we look at planetary dignity. Um, anyone else want to talk, discuss about that before we move on to another topic? Dayanandiji? Uh, just one little comment. Uh, well, I appreciate your presentation, Sunali, and your comments, Sam. I just noticed, too, the Parivartana yogas that occur with the nakshatra rulers and how powerful they can be as well. And the planet and nakshatras sometimes ruled by Mercury also seem to me to have connections with astrology and Mercury being such an important planet in terms of communication. So just wanted to add those couple of comments. Amen to that. That's my Aunt Makarika in the 10th house. So hopefully what you say tends to work out. <laughs> um, now for the next question, I would like to um, ask Ronnie G, but Sunili G, thank you for your excellent presentation. Now my next question is for Ronnie G, um, and let's make sure your mic is unmuted, Ronnie. There we go. Perfect. Ronnie, would you please begin to discuss the use of nakshatra for muhurta? I will. But in 10 minutes, it's going to be tough. So I know, I hope this elicits some conversation. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about just before I go right into the nakshatras is the whole idea of muhurta, which is, which is twofold. You know, for one it has to do with um, a period of 48 minutes. That's one definition of Mohorta, are 48 minutes, which is two gatis in, um, in India. But the other definition is that Mohorta means a moment. So it really is electing a moment in time that is conducive to an event. I'm gonna to try to talk about it, that how it relates to our modern world, <clears throat> rather than things like um, initiate, you know, Ipayana or, you know, going into the forest and certain rituals that um, in the um, Atarva Veda or the other Vedas, that was really the key to why they used Mahorta. And also marriage is a very, very, very big deal. Um, so I want to just focus on that and say that when you use Mahorta with nakshatras, you definitely want to take that as just one little part of it. You know, never look at something and say, oh my God, this is an awful muhurta and I cannot do anything, mostly because of the fact that you want to look at the, the vara, the day of the week, you want to look at the titi, you want to look at the yoga, the karana, all the panchang elements, you want to look at the planetary hour, and then of course you just want to look up the chart in general. So whenever you see a really, you know, nakshatra that is not good let's say for what you wanted and then tarabala which dennis will talk about the um the whole idea is what i always tell my students really is that it there's such a totality and because of that totality that is really um what you want to you know really really want to take notice of so i just wanted to share my screen for a minute and see if i can do this um can you see that on my screen? Yes, it's working well. Okay, slideshow from, let me get the slideshow so it looks a little better from the current slide. So the first thing that I wanted to say is that I want to talk about one thing that traditionally you're not supposed to do. Again, there could be, you know, other, you know, mitigating circumstances. So the important thing is not to, for anything, if you can, do anything on what's called the nakshatra gandanta. And so many people talk about gandanta, what it is, and it really is basically the last pada, which is the last quarter of a nakshatra, so that's three degrees, 20 minutes, of uh, the, what's really called, in a sense, the water signs, but that came later on the element. And then the first pada, or the zero to three degrees, 20 minutes, 
of the fire signs. Uh, you can also say those are the uh, nakshatras that are ruled by Mercury and Ketu. So you get the last pada of Mercury ruled nakshatras and the first pada of the Ketu ruled nakshatra. So you get 26, 40 degrees of Pisces to zero degrees of Aries, zero Aries to three degrees of 20 Aries and so on. And so those are the last Naksha, the last padas of Revati, Ashlesha, and Jeshta, and then you get the first pada of Ashvini, Maga, and Mula. I'm just starting with that to say, don't do anything on those if you can help it. Otherwise, you can look at everything else. So really what I want to say is that take everything into account. It's so important. The other, on the other hand, um, even though we have what's called Abhijit Nakshatra, which is between 5 and 10 degrees of Utrashada, we also what, have what's called Abhijit Mohurta. And the Abhijit Mohurta says that if you do anything, one gati on either side of local noontime, so that's between 11.36 a.m. and 12.24 p.m., you can actually do that. And I have a client in India who got married, and he could not find a good nakshatra for marriage. So what he did was he gave her the time of 12.11 p.m., and he told her it was Abhijit. She thought it was the Abhijit nakshatra. So I kept looking at the chart and saying, no, it's not. I said, but it's this Abhijit rule that you can, um, you can use. So I just want to talk then about the categories of nakshatras, because I don't have that long. And these are from Briyat Samhita, from Varaha Mahira, chapter 98, um, and some of my modern interpretations. And, and other places you can find good Mahorta text is Bivi Raman's book, Mahorta, Dennis Harness's book, The Nakshatras, and also uh, Dr. Charak's book, Element of Vedic Astrology, part two. I should also say that you can really get a lot of nice apps but to look at the current um, planetary weather, the nakshatras, the titis, whatever, Cosmic Insights, Dr. Pai's uh, company has a wonderful app, um, and also estrojoti.com. You can get a calendar in any temple, any Hindu temple. They always have these beautiful calendars. So going quickly, um, there are uh, six categories that you want to put the nakshatras in, and that's one is the Dhruva or Shtira category, which are the fixed nakshatras, Rohini, Uttara Palguni, Uttara Shada, and Uttara Padrapada, and those are good for fixed things. So anything that you want permanent for, you know, foundations, getting a house, building something, a marriage, for instance. Um, I had my marriage ordained, uh, blessed by uh, an Indian astrologer, and mine was Uttara Padrapada. So um, in two weeks, I'll be celebrating my 20th anniversary. So I think it worked pretty well. Um, and then you have the Tikshna or the sharp nakshatras, Mula, Jeshta, Ardra, and Ashlesha, which everybody gets really nervous about. But you know what? These are good for surgery because it has to do with sharpness. It has to do with sharp instruments. And also, you can be successful in attacks. I tell people, try to start, you know, lawsuits, divorce proceedings, any, well, divorce proceedings, if you can't do mediation, offensive actions, anything where you have to attack, do them on the hard nakshatras, the tikshna nakshatra, or as we see, the ugra nakshatras. These are also good for magic and incantations, imprisonment. So what it means is that if you're an attorney, you might be able to get a guilty verdict if you're lucky enough to have the jury come back and do it on one of these nakshatras. And it can also be good really for starting anything that has to do with a ritual, anything that has to do with a spiritual practice, a diet, an exercise routine, anything that you have to um, renounce something really. Um, and then you have the Ugra nakshatras, which is Purva Palguni and Purva Shada, Purva Bhadrapada, Barani and Maga. And this, these are the cruel nakshatras. So most of the time, you don't want to do anything unto them. But actually, if you want to have a battle, you want to ruin an enemy, or you want to even have a political campaign, you know, and you want to win by playing dirty, let's say, <laughs> you can also um, use those nakshatras. Um, and then you have the chikra or swift, or lagu is another word for light nakshatras, Ashvini, Pushyahasta, and Abhijit. 
Um, and these have to do with just, you know, nice things, artistic things, traveling for pleasure, um, anything that's pleasurable, enjoyable, quick decision making. Of course, there's a lot more involved in all these. I'm trying to kind of sum, sum things up a little bit. Um, and then you have the Mridu or the gentle, tender nakshatras. They're also called Maitra or we know Mitra as friends. Um, and they have to do with Chitra, Anuradha, Mrikshira, Revati, the eye got cut off. Um, and it has to do also with the fine arts, sexuality, creativity, marriage. You will also find that in lists of nakshatras, the, the best book is Mahorta. I mean, Dennis has a lot of them also, but B.V. Raman's book has like a Mahorta for every little thing you want to do. Um, if you get that book, it's really good. And this can have to do with marriage and pleasure. And remember, it does say that if you want to do something under these nakshatras, chakras, um, especially marriage, <clears throat> it says don't do it under the last pada of revity. And that's because of the very thing I started with, that you don't want to do something under a gandanta nakshatra. Um, and then you have the movable nakshatras, the chara nakshatras, uh, shravana, danishta, shatisha, navasu, swati. Um, and they're good for buying things, travel, anything that requires change. Even great life changes like marriage. Some of these are marriageable nakshatras also. Um, and then you get what's called the muridu um, tichna, where uh, they are the combination of, you know, because they're not all cut and dry. Um, and those are kritika and um, vishaka. Um, and then you also have something that you will read about that's called the panchaka, <clears throat> panchaka nakshatra, which is anything that you have when the moon is in Ari, Aquarius and Pisces. So it's the second half of Danishta to the end of Revati. And actually, you can do things under those nakshatras, but you're not supposed to do anything like cremating the dead, um, thatching a roof, you know, all, a lot of things that you might not always relate to. Um, but those are the kind of things. And then here we have specific activities that, again, are going to overlap. Um, <clears throat> but again, just, you know, make sure that when you are doing um, these things that you can also um, look at all the other factors involved. Um, and then the last thing I want to end with is Pushya, because Pushya is supposed to be like the universal nakshatra, um, because it is in Cancer. It's where um, uh, the exaltation of Cancer of Jupiter is, but you're not supposed to get married under Pushya. So uh, the Saturn rulership, and it's, it's a beautiful spiritual nakshatra. So uh, that's something that uh, I want to end with, I guess. Um, there's a lot more to say, so I'm going to leave that to everybody else to do. <laughs> Thank you, Ronnie G, so much. If you could please share, uh, unshare your screen. Um, I will unshare my screen. Let's go back to here. Sorry. Oh, stop share. Okay, stop share. There you go. And then I will okay. go to our gallery view and get us all talking about Mwaherta. So who wants to comment on Nakshatra and Mwaherta? It's one of, I mean, I can't believe what you did in 10 minutes. <laughs> uh, I, I don't think you- I'm used to that. I don't think you could have done a more concise and complete job in the amount of time that you had possible. So my hat's off to you and much respect. Um, would any of the astrologers like to comment on Mwaherta and Nakshatra? Yeah, uh, I would like to say something about it. Ronnie, uh, it was a fantastic presentation by you and very good uh, presentation for Murta. See, Nakshat, basically, Panchan is totally based on ja uh, Nakshatras only. Like Tithi, Var, Karan, Nakshatra. Panchan is ma majority because previously Nakshatras were uh, only into existence. There were no planets, nothing. Later on, everything came. Later on, zodiac signs came because of the shape of particular nakshatra. As you were talking about the murtas, uh, I will just say the specific murta, uh, because many people ask about it. If we wear a ruby, or if we have, have to start any Surya mantra, Surya-related remedy, if we have to start, so it is said that Punarvasu nakshatra is the best nakshatra to start 
any surya mantra or to wear a ruby same way magha nakshatra is a wealth giving nakshatra mula nakshatra is a uh, uh, if you want to make a siddhi or if you want to just uh, start a new uh, mantra chanting so all ketu nakshatras are said to be fantastic to start anything related to education or mantra shastra same way the deity of purva uh, falguni that is aryama we have to worship this deity before starting building the house or before starting building any uh, project okay so so many things are written in our uh, scriptures and ashwini nakshatra is it is the first nakshatra so ashwini is said to be holy nakshatra to do start any type of work any type of work ashwini nakshatra is the best nakshatra to start with then for particular events we have to uh, go for different nakshatra tithi var karan like that that is what i wanted to share thank you sunili thank you rani anyone else would like to comment so to see the g please <clears throat> yes can i share my screen always and i get a couple minutes here cool i i just want to um show some quotes and that was a great presentation ronnie and one of the reasons is because you mentioned the gandanta and of course in brett prashra they measure out the gandanta with nakshatra it's called nakshatra gandanta then there's lagna gandanta there are other ones but the thing to understand is that in prashra in the very early chapters he pins the nakshatras and the rashis together so when he talks about the nakshatra gandanta the rashis are already implicit in that there's no reason to go back and say now don't forget jeshta is in scorpio and mula is in sagittarius there's there's no reason to go back and restate it's already implicit when you have this section of the sky the rashis are there so that as you mentioned but um that it is a nakshatra a uh, rule but we can see right here that when the zodiac is indicated they're always pinned to nakshatras it starts with nakshatras because in the vedas it started with nakshatras measuring space so we can just see those are called grahas that move through the nakshatras in the zodiac the said zodiac comprises 27 nakshatras commencing from ashwini the same area is divided into 12 equal rashis commencing from mesha so right there uh, you have nakshatras and rashis totally aligned then we go to brihat jataka in the celestial chakra the signs commencing with mesha and ashwini are each formed by nine padas which are the nakshatra quarters and govern the following organs of the kalpurusha from horasara two and a quarter stars make one rashi which means two and a quarter nakshatras each of the 12 signs is constituted by two and a quarter stars or nine padas with ashwini in the start in aries and revati at the end in pisces jataka parijata kriya aries and other zodiacal signs in the heavens consist of nine quarters of stars reckoning from ashwini so there is no there's no you know discussion about whether or not that's the way they spoke about the zodiac in in um indian astrology and it starts with the it starts with the nakshatras because the nakshatras are the original zodiac from the vedanga jyotisha as we're mentioning here even before they were measuring planets and had the 12 zodiac scheme they were they were finding mahorta and things that mainly had to do with the sun moon and these increments of time and because they were measuring time not just space with nakshatras it's foundational to everything in indian astrology when i'm going to present here in a minute i'm going to talk about sidereal time and space with nakshatras in the vedanga jyotisha but i just wanted to put that out there right now so we have a kind of anchor as well for what we're talking about with what the nakshatras are they're anchoring space and time and your presentation about these different qualities of the nakshatras was absolutely brilliant um and succinct and fantastic i'm going to post a link to this um in the chat so everybody can download it as well but I just wanted to circle back on that idea especially with the with the with the gandanta principle and the fact that the direction is given with nakshatras but because earlier in the text they already defined what the nakshatra scheme is you only need to do it once they're saying they're saying rashis and nakshatras are aligned 
They don't need to go back and repeat it every time the principle is displayed. In fact, it's bad scholarship because many of these texts had to be memorized. So they wouldn't go back and say, don't forget, <laughs> you know, it's Rashi's. <laughs> no, that's what, the, that's what the direction is. And everything is pinned to the sidereal nakshatra-based sky. So as you know, I'm preaching to the choir, but I just wanted to put that out as a, as a flag and as a foundational principle. Thank you, Siva, very much. Anyone else like to come in on Muharta? Um, Dr. Pai, I would love to hear what you'd have to say. Um, you know, I think it's interesting, you know, everybody talking about uh, the Gandanta and, uh, and my own study with Gandanta. What I've seen with Gandanta is you see that it's a um, Gandanta are those points in the zodiac where a Rashi and a Nakshatra are going to end. You know, you see a perfect correlation where a Nakshatra ends and a zodiac sign ends. And you always see that it's between a watery sign and a fiery sign. Okay. And why do you think uh, people fear about Gandanta? Is because water is associated with the past and fire is associated with future. And when you come to this point, exactly, just about a few degrees, that's you're in the present. So a lot of people, when they are in the present, they're neither connecting with the past, neither connecting with the, with, with the, with the future. So a, many, you know, a lot of people who live in the past or live in the future, they will find it difficult to manage with the present. So Gandanta is exactly the point where you're dealing with the present materialistic and the present, uh, you know, spiritual. Another point that I want to make with Gandanta is uh, there are three Gandantas. One is called as Swa Gandanta, that's between uh, Revati and Ashwini Nakshatra. That's called Swa because it's between the 12th house and the first house, Swa. And what I've seen there is both these nakshatras are, um, you know, um, Trianga Mukha. Trianga means facing forward. So imagine a moon, you know, kind of, you know, traversing this point, you know, from Revati, which is forward looking, it moves into uh, Ashwini, which is also forward looking. So that kind of transition for the moon is going to be not very bad. So that, that's why a lot of people don't talk about this Gandanta. The next Gandanta is called as Matru Gandanta. That's between the fourth house and the fifth house, which is Ashlesha and Maga. And both these nakshatras are Adhomukha. Adhomukha means they're facing downwards. So imagine a moon which is falling downwards, which is moving downwards, you know, so from Magha, it's kind of moving downwards. And it goes to, uh, sorry, from Ashlesha, downward, facing Nakshatra. And it goes to Magha, which is also downward. So that's why this Gandanta is a little bit downward facing. Okay. And the last Gandanta, which is most feared, is Jeshta and Mula. Because, you know, Jeshta is a Tiksha Nakshatra as Ronnie had already said, Tikshna Daruna Nakshatra, and it's facing forwards. And suddenly the moon will feel as though it has got a drop. It's like a waterfall. Because Mula is a, you know, another Tikshna Nakshatra, and suddenly it starts facing downwards. So as though the moon is just going to go downwards from where it is facing. So this is the most you know, important Gandanta, which is most, most feared. So I feel, you know, Ashlesha being a Tikshna Nakshatra or a Dharma Nakshatra, which is bitter, which is sharp, which is dreadful. Going into Ugra Nakshatra, which is uh, Maga. So that's, that, that point is going to be a, a difficult point because the, 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 the Gandanta between Revati, which is Mridu, as Roni, uh, you know, Roni has already mentioned, going into a Shipa Nakshatra, it's not going to be too bad the transition for the moon because it's just moving forwards. 
and from a tikshna to a going down to a ugra nakshatra it's going to be feel little bit but imagine if it is tikshna to tikshna and then the face is just going to go down so that's why i feel uh, the you know jupiter now is transiting this gandanta zone and that's why i think a lot of people are feeling a little bit iffy about this whole transition you know, this transition between um, you know going back and forth between you know a downward facing nakshatra which is mula and which is revati which is a you know a forward facing nakshatra and this is called as pitra pitra gandanta between the ninth house and the eighth house so swagandanta matrigandanta pitra gandanta so i think this is what i have been researching on and that's why people feel a little bit more you know troubled when there is transitions happening between jyestha and mula more so than a revati and uh, you know ashwini or from uh, you know ashlesha to maga thank you dr pai for that illumination and just always the way you put things uh and the relationship as these nakshatras move into each other it's very poetic um i do want to kind of get to the next topic but is there any short comments as far as more heritage that would like to be discussed of course rani ji yeah i just i just wanted to say thank you everybody for adding to that 10 minutes <laughs> <laughs> but i i and thanks shanati i just wanted to also say to sam when i use the zodiac i also just use it also as a point of reference because there are many people who when they come into astrology rather than learn the nakshatras first they're actually learning the zodiac first even though we know that in the vedas there are the hymns in the atharva veda the hymns are to the nakshatras and in the briya samhita there is no mention of the signs at all in fact the mention of the nakshatras are really along with the devatas that they are associated with so yes those nakshatras were the device for measuring time and space long before the zodiac came in i do that often i do that for often the students who are coming in and seeing this for the first time and even though we should be teaching nakshatras first which i did when i was in india um sometimes they learn zodiac first you know so i think that's the confusion that many students have that i hope all of us as teachers straighten out a lot with with that the whole sidereal nakshatra importance and yeah and the whole sidereal zodiac that's yeah. another story dayananda did you want to say something ji oh, i just wanted to show um ahurta by bibi raman you can tell a great book when the cover is worn off of it you know so um in raman's uh, chapter 3 he said the most important factors in mahurta in addition to rani's the qualities of the nakshatras is um tara bala which we'll talk about a little bit later chandra bala which is of course the strength of the moon in general and then as rani mentioned panchanga the five elements and so dr raman just really puts those to a big test in terms of mahurta so that's it Any one or two minute more her to comments before we move on Sadasiva. It's not a one or two minute comment but because of the constant unmuting I I just wanted to say to Ronnie absolutely and I don't want it to come off like I was correcting you on any level. That's what I wanted to say. It wasn't that like oh you didn't say that. Yeah. Again now she's trying to wave cuz she can't speak directly out there so all I'm saying is that no I was just clarifying I was just clarifying so that people didn't understand so that people would make sure to understand as you just did as well that when they spoke just of nakshatra at that point it's implicit just because they're not also mentioning rashi doesn't mean that well then we have no idea what zodiac they were talking about you mm -hmm. know which signs are with jeshta and mula no when they said jeshta and mula they had already said what the what, you know how the rashis align with jeshta and mula and ashwini so that's all i was saying so people have a context so they're not confused by that as you just clarified in another way cuz it's very important that people do understand that there's just no doubt about what they were doing with the with the 12 rashis at that time they clearly define it at the beginning of the text and just because they never say it again every time there's a point that someone might have contention with doesn't mean that that's not still the case in fact it would be really bad scholarship to keep mentioning it all the time every time there's a point that could possibly be 
dispute it. It's mm -hmm. never disputed after it's mentioned. That's what it is. And it's and the issue is decided at the beginning of the text. So Ronnie, do you want to say something? Because it's important. I just wanted to say I, I, I'm thankful for everybody adding everything. Yeah. Because that 10 minutes is like, oh my god, what do I do in 10 minutes? So the discussion enhanced everybody, everybody, whatever, what, whatever you said was a wonderful enhancement. Awesome. Great. So thank you. It was, uh, uh, I just wanted to say that it was fantastic addition by Mr. Arjun Pai. Ronnie, you really started with the good points, Gandanta, because Gandanta is very important. And I think whatever research Arjun Pai you have made, so maybe it is connected to the all Padas, which we say, first, second, third, fourth, fourth Pada. That is why we say it is a Matru Kashta, Pitru Kashta or uh, uh, grief to the self, self-grooming or something. All these Gandanta nakshatras are reversely affecting to the family or to the native himself or herself. So that is why Gandanta points uh, plays a very, very important role here. And that is why the nakshatra puja or nakshatra shanti is very, very necessary no doubt you can do it at home or two. You can just. Uh, is my voice proper? It's uh, it's okay. It's yeah. It's so changing. that is why uh, we all have to chant the particular nakshatra mantra every day. Whoever's nakshatras are in Gandanta point, and this really uh, works fantastically if we chant nakshatra mantras. Thank you, Sunili G. And there was just one comment I wanted to make when Sam was bringing up the ancient slokas. And uh, at the end of that kind of understanding, which has been there forever as a foundation for us as Vedic astrologers, um, you don't have to listen to the Rishi. Uh, but why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you is my question. You don't have to, but why wouldn't you? So my next question um, is actually, Dr. Paiji, are you still here? Yeah, I'm here, yeah. Excellent. So my question for you, is would you please share some of your favorite, you know, profound analysis and research concerning nakshatra or nakshatra groups? Anything which is really striking you right now in terms of your nakshatra research? Okay, um, I'm just going to follow on what Ronnie has been uh, talking about nakshatras and the grouping of nakshatras. Uh, it was fascinating that she is talking about all the different categorization of nakshatras. Um, this was a research that we did, uh, uh, you know, some time ago with uh, Dr. Aditya Togi. Um, so let me share my screen. Can everybody see my screen? Yes, okay. Dr. Pai, yes. Yeah, <clears throat> this is a very fascinating uh, thing about nakshatras that uh, was presented by Dr. Togi uh, in one of our internal uh, you know, research programs that we have at Cosmic Insights. It's called the Mantri Nakshatra Research Seminar. And he presented this a while ago so I'm just presenting whatever his findings are. And all of this is based on the declination of the nakshatras with respect to uh, the ecliptic. The ecliptic, uh, the ecliptic is the path of the sun, right? So what he has done is he has identified each of these nakshatras and he has shown here through the declination that from the ecliptic, you know, what nakshatras are the farthest most from the ecliptic and what nakshatras are the most closest to the ecliptic. 
and nobody has even done any research on this and this is very very fascinating now what you can see here is uh, you know Ronnie G talked about Abhijit Nakshatra Abhijit Nakshatra is usually the most preferred Nakshatra for marriages or oh, sorry not Abhijit Nakshatra the Abhijit Muhurta okay Abhijit Muhurta there's a difference between Abhijit Nakshatra and Abhijit Muhurta that's what she clarified as well Abhijit Muhurta operates two times in a day and Abhijit Muhurta is you know it happens in the morning typically based on the sunrise you know when the sun is right above you and Lord Sri Ram uh, from the Ishwaku dynasty the Ragupul or the solar dynasty he was born when the sun was in Abhijit, uh, Abhijit Muhurta during the sun was at the peak in the sky right and Lord Shri Krishna who is from the Luna dynasty was born in Abhijit Muhurta during night midnight now can you see that Abhijit Nakshatra, which is a fixed star, which is a Vega, which is with the declination is the farthest most. In the northern, you know, uh, in the direction from the ecliptic is the most northernmost star. You know, it, it makes sense that, you know, Krishna, also they say, you know, he, he kind of exploded, it became a supernova, Abhijit Nakshatra, because, you know, there's a story behind it. Maybe another time I'll tell you with, uh, you know, uh, Sahadeva, one of the Pancha Pandavas, the five Pandavas, it was one of the greatest astrologer. So Duryodhan goes to him and he says, when is the best time that I should wage the war? Okay, so that I'll win the war. And he says, do it on Abhijit Nakshatra and Abhijit Murta, you win the war. And Krishna says, Goodness Lord, you know, you're from the Pandava side, you know, you're a greatest astrologer. I know that, you know, why did you have to say him this secret? He said, you know, when somebody approaches me as an astrologer, I have to give them the right advice. He, he, he didn't come to me like a Kaurava, like an enemy. He came to me as somebody who is trying to seek advice. So Abhijit Nakshatra and Abhijit Murta is very important. So you can see that. Another thing what I want to say to you, based on what Ronnie was saying, I, you know, people can go back to her presentation, what she did. And you can see, you know, it's very surprising to see two nakshatras, which are called as Mishra or mixed nakshatras, which is, you know, soft, you know, sharp, because mixed means it is both soft as, as well as sharp, uh, as sharp. You know, mixture of all qualities that you see. So you can see that it's in the, the northern part. This, these nakshatras are in the northern part of the ecliptic, both Kritika and Vishaka. These nakshatras are very good to start, commence something related to uh, you know, any fire rituals, fire sacrifices and all of this. Okay. So this is one thing. Second thing is look at what we call as the nakshatras, which are grouped as agile or mobile or chara or chala. You know, this, these nakshatras usually give you more, you know, adventurous nature, wandering, ambitious, trying to travel very far. You know, it gives you good expedition, motion and exchange. You wouldn't be surprised to see most of the Chara nakshatras are in the northern hemisphere, or I mean, to the north of the ecliptic. Look at these nakshatras, which, you know, Rani actually mentioned. She said the Panchak nakshatras. Panchak nakshatras start from the third pada of the Nishta going up to Revati, the fourth pada. Usually in the southern part of India, if anybody expires or anybody, you know, expires during this nakshatras, there is a special ritual that is done. Anybody who expires when moon is transiting from third pada of Dhanishta to the fourth pada of Revati, the special rituals that is done. You can see here, 
all the nakshatras which are more of chara are falling very far apart and what is surprising to see is you can see swati nakshatra which is you know the fixed star arcturus which is called as the northernmost star it's called nistya okay nistya means an outcast many call many of them call it you know uh, or even betelgeuse betelgeuse is the farthermost in the southern hemisphere i mean southern to the south of the you know of the ecliptic this is a declination i'm talking about so you see a lot of you know um, chara nakshatras in the northern side of things of the ecliptic ex with the exception of uh, shatavishak then we go to the shipra and the lagu which is the light you know and uh, the movable which kind of helps you to achieve results very quickly for example you know rani or somebody else i think even uh, sunili ji mentioned about ashwini nakshatra being used for anything that you wanted to start because you get quick results and you can see that abhijit is also which means abhijit is now an intercalary nakshatra <clears throat> but still if you're in that zone when moon is transiting you know ronnie mentioned about between 5 degrees typically between 5 degrees to 10 degrees of uh, capricorn that's when is the best time to start some uh, new opportunities and new work and then you have ashwini nakshatra which can get you quick healing if you wanted to start administering medicine or taking some healing uh, you know properties and ashwini is a good thing you can see that all of these nakshatras with the exception of hasta which is Del delta karvi which is in the in in the southern side of the ecliptic okay then you come to what is called as fierce strong and bold two minute warning dr pai ji so you see look at this ugra ugra nakshatras which is fierce strong and bold they are more powerful daring they are very assertive you see still a lot happening in the northern hemisphere I mean, I mean, I don't mean northern hemisphere, not not to the ecliptic, with the exception of Purvashara. Okay, so you can refer back to Rani's presentation to see what it means, right? Then you have study nakshatras. This is very very interesting to see. Amongst the study nakshatras, you see two of them in the north of the ecliptic, two of the nakshatras in the south of the ecliptic. Okay, these are, are Dhruva or Sthira nakshatras. Which gives you more of persistence, patience. They are fixed, enduring. If you want something for a long term, then these are those nakshatras. Then you have something called as mridu nakshatra, which are soft, mild, tender, affectionate. They're timid. They come, you know, they're beautiful. They're intelligent. All of these are in the southern hemisphere. Uh, I mean, south to the ecliptic. Okay, and finally, you see which are all the tragic. The dreadful, better, piercing, tikshna, darona nakshatras, which are more dissenting, you know, operating very secretively, mysteriously, and they, these have very spiritual ways as well, you know, which is jista, mula, you know, you have ashlesha and ardra. They are all south of the ecliptic. So there is a very important code that I want to teach you with the groupings of nakshatras, with this presentation. So, you know, you, you can just go back to Ronnie's presentation and see, you know, when she's talking about that. I wanted to highlight that, you know, how was this whole thing being, you know, studied by our ancient seers? And they have categorized this nakshatra so beautifully. Okay. So that's that's something that I wanted to share. Uh, Thank Shanati. you, Dr. Pai. That presentation was absolutely excellent. I am just very touched in the heart and... It is very compelling to see all of the patterns and the groupings of the nakshatras and how the rishis have seen them through the years and as we as modern astrologers are trying to incorporate this wisdom uh, and into a service that we can help uh, others and ourselves with our karmic evolution. Would someone else like to comment on uh, Dr. Pai's research um, before we move on? Rani? Um. That was that was wonderful, and I have to say that Dr. Pai and and I had no idea what we were going to be really presenting. So it just turned out wonderful that your presentation was a great follow-up to to what I did because 
you could choose anything with Muhurta and Nakshatra. So thank you for that. And I think that the, the important thing, a couple of important things to really research and think about is that, you know, astrology originally was observational and that is really what the, you know, the stars, the stars were so important, you know, the Yogatara, because that really gave the nakshatras so much of their meaning and being able to locate them in the sky. And I think Abhijit, you know, I think that's the fascinating factor here, you know, because when you had those original 28 nakshatras, which in the Artarva Veda, they talk about 28, as in the Briyat Samhita, they were not thinking of it in terms of equality, you know, like we have to have 27 of 13 degrees, 20 minutes. They were basing it on the stars. And because Abhijit was, the, the star was so much farther away with declination, I think when they then made the 27, which had to correlate evenly with the Rashis, you know, Abhijit sort of was out out there, it, it wasn't with the zodiac. It did not correspond to the declination of the zodiacal stars. But we were so used to, from the Vedas, Abhijit was included. So you have to still include it when you're really looking at, you know, mantras and when you're looking at devatas and when you're looking at activities, because that was so important, you know, looking at it side by side. So I think Abhijit is like one of those fascinating nakshatras to, to really think about because you know when you're looking at thinking of ancient people looking at the sky and then the zodiac came around you had that star which was you know far out there and the other thing that's fascinating too i think i'm gonna close soon i know i don't want to give too much time is when you start really looking at different rituals from south and north india and east india and you can really that that table that you showed us really showed that in these different parts of india you could see the stars differently. And a lot of those rituals were based on the fact that you see those stars differently in different areas of India. So I could talk more and more. That was wonderful. I really appreciated that, you know. Yeah, and my experience of the study of Nakshatra Abhijit seems to be this forgotten or miss nakshatra but much more as you get into the energy of it it is the chosen nakshatra it is the one which has all this special quad quality and this auspiciousness auspiciousness associated with it dr pai dr pai uh just on your mic okay uh okay. there you go yeah thank you um that's great ronnie uh for identifying this and this is another research that um which is fascinating for all the viewers to find that the president of United States of America and his coronation ceremony always happens around the 20th of January, around about that time. That's when the sun is in Abhijit Nakshatra. You can just go back and see. I think ever since the 1950s or 1960s, they have made this as a thing that, you know, the coronation or the, the swearing in ceremony of the, the president of the United States always happens around the 20th of, you know, around that time. That's when the sun is in Abhijit Nakshatra. So it's, it can't be, you know, something which we can think that, you know, it is a coincidence. Why have they chosen that around the, Jan, you know, around January, that, that period, why would they want to have the coronation? Why would they have the, want to have the, uh, the swearing in ceremony always happening on the sa almost the same date? Round about that same time. Just go and see in the last you know, six or seven presidencies, the swearing in ceremony has happened around that time. That's when the sun is in Abhijit Nakshatra. So does anyone have anything pressing to say before, before we move on, uh, Sadasiva? I want to say something pressing just as it relates right now to the presentation I'm also about to give when I give it. And it's just directly related to the fact we keep talking about Abhijit the 28 or 27 nakshatras. One of the reasons I'm about to explain as well is in the Vedanga Jyotisha, which I'm about to talk about, they were using nakshatras not just for astrological purposes, which they weren't using them really for astrological forecasting at that time. They were using them to measure time and space. And so you can see very clearly, <clears throat> we can see from the Vedanga Jyotisha, <clears throat> these, are, these are quotes um, 
that not only were nakshatras measuring both the northern and southern course and whatnot, but we also see that they were measuring six seasons multiplied by four and a half nakshatras. This is the sun's movement through nakshatras was how they measured the seasons. There's a, there are statements in the Vedanga Jyotisha, four and a half asterismal segments is one ritu, which means the sun moving through four and a half nakshatras is one season. So if you multiply four and a half um, asterisms times 20, um, I'm sorry, times six, you get 27 nakshatras. And this right here, five year yugas were measured by nakshatras transited by the sun in five years. A statement from the Vedanga Jyotisha says, in the same way, the total of the asterisms of the sun, which comes around five times, is 135. So they measured five year cycles by the sun's transit through 135 nakshatras. So do the math, five times 27 is 135. So the nakshatras are not just these things we use for astrology charts at this point, and they're not just stars along the ecliptic above or below the, or above or below the um, ecliptic as Dr. Pai just beautifully laid out, it was fantastic. They're actually all of these things. And it doesn't mean that one cancels another. It's the sky, for God's sake. It's the Akash, like Sunaliji said, the Akash Mandal. But they were measuring space and time. The planets are moving through space, and we're a product of time. That's why they always say the Kala Purusha and whatnot. But we have to be clear to understand that the portion of the nakshatra, the reason they're 27 or 28, is because this approximates the moon's motion in one day. But they're not just connected to the moon. Again, we always say, well, nakshatras come from the moon. That, that portion of space comes roughly from the movement of the moon through the sky visually, but they were absolutely measuring, measuring time by the sun's movement through nakshatras because the sun is the only thing you can measure consistently. And so they were measuring time by the sun's movement through the nakshatras. In my presentation, I'm going to talk about this more. I'm going to break out many of these different things from the Yajurveda. Um, but this, in my, in my opinion, this is why eventually Abhijit became part of Uttarashada and became part of that. It's still part of the forecasting and the spiritual Mahorta cycle, but because it doesn't line up with that time forecasting and that time relationship, which is what the Zodiac is, it, it stopped being part of the convention and, and instead became this small portion that's a sort of unique, you know, it's the star Vega, which is a very powerful blue giant star and all like that. So there's a lot of reasons to look at that. But this is certainly a potential um, and, a, and a very powerful explanation. Whoa, I don't know what's going on here. Sam, so, um, Sam your presentation is also coming out next. So, which, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. But I just wanted to add that at this portion. So I can present the rest of it next. But as it relates to Abhiji 2728, this is a very plausible reason why. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Paiji, please. Yeah. Uh, there's another observation that I wanted to share with all the viewers. Do you know which day of the year when the sun is the farthest most from? Uh, I mean, the earth is the farthest most from the earth uh, from the sun which day of the year when the sun is the farthest most from planet earth it's called perihelion and it's the fourth of july i wonder why the united states has chosen fourth of july to be its you know the what do you call the independence day isn't it Correct me if I'm wrong. That's correct. The 4th of July, isn't it? Yes. So the coronation of the president is happening when it's in Uttarashada and the Independence Day is celebrated whenever the sun is the farthest most from the earth. I leave the rest to the rest of the, the, the panelists and for the viewers to actually decide what it means. The implications of that are intense. Sunili. Yeah, uh, 
Arjun ji, it was fantastic, wonderful presentation. You just described the uh, whatever were written in the scriptures. You just uh, elaborated uh, the thing to make it more uh, good uh, with good understanding. So what I uh, guess from this that as Abhijit being the Shipra Nakshatra, that is Lagu Nakshatra. So Abhijit Ashwini uh, Hasta and Magha Nakshatra are very pious nakshatras. So all these nakshatra and Pushya Nakshatra also, all these nakshatras plays so very important role in Murta Shastra. Otherwise also, so it is said that uh, Magha deities, uh, Pitrus, that is why on earth whoever uh, takes the last read in the Magha Nakshatra, it is said that this uh, this person who is dead is going to go into the Nakshatra Loka because the people who goes into the Nakshatra Loka are not supposed to reborn on the earth. So getting the Nakshatra Loka is very, very important. And one more thing as you elaborated about Dhru or Steady Tara or uh, Cruel Mixed Piercing Stars. So whoever in our charts also, if we have particular nakshatras, maximum nakshatras in, uh, or ma maximum planets in piercing nakshatras or Dhruva or steady nakshatras or shipra nakshatras, our nature and personality is also according to those nakshatras only. Our satisfaction level and our karma level depends on the nakshatra, whatever you described in your chart. 100% Suneeli Ji, thank you so much. So just for time's sake, I'm gonna trans transition to our next question. Thanks, I hope that's okay with everybody. Uh, my next question is for Sadasiva Ji. Would you please discuss and elaborate the nakshatra as defining the zodiac and measuring out both space and time as seen in Vedanga Jyotish? Absolutely. I will do it. I will take that on. <laughs> okay, so, um, yeah, I've already spoken a little bit about it. Um, just to sort of, um, you know, cross-reference a few things that have been said, because, um, um, you know, there are so many issues, and the nakshatras are so vast, and there's so many ways to interpret them um, as stars, as lunar mansions. But underneath it all, they really represent the sort of foundational quantity of measurement in Vedic astrology, both space and time. Because again, when we understand what astrology is, it's actually an exercise in space and time. And time is space. This is even Einstein's theory, right? Space and time, space, you know, the time-space continuum. And the unit of measurement really, at least the most basic fundamental building block, is the nakshatra and again, we're not used to thinking it as a measurement in time, but in space. But I'm just going to read through the, um, you know, a lot of these statements from the Vedanga Jyotish, which is the first, it's really the pure Vedic part of Vedic astrology. There's some who said, well, Vedic astrology is not really Vedic because, um, you know, there's nothing about it in the Vedas. Well, that's not true. It's in the Yajur Veda and in the Rig Veda. Um, and elaborated more in the Krishna Yajurveda. So just going to read off this and then um, we'll um, sort of take it from there. But it says the ancient Indians possessed a mastery and understanding of space and time that exceeded their neighbors, at least as it relates to organizing the calendar and the zodiac. So there are two different things. The calendar measures the earth going around the sun, which has to do with seasons and what's called the scion of zodiac, which is the zodiac with the Ayanamsha, but the zodiac measures objects circling the earth moving through space. So there are two different things, the earth going around the sun and objects moving around the earth. One of those objects is in fact also the sun. That's why it's confusing because we have two different measurements, but one object we're measuring two different ways because, because we not only observe the sun going through the sky from where we're standing, but we're also circling the sun. So this creates that conflation. So one we measure with the calendar, whether we're using astrology or not, and the other we're measuring with, with uh, the zodiac. So 
the Indians really understood all of this. They got it right. They understood it. In fact, all the ancient cultures did, the Babylonians, the Greeks, all of them understood there were two different calculations, right? But the Indians really dialed in the specificity of the length of the year and all kinds of other things um, all the way back in the Yajur Veda, which was 1500 to 1200 BC. So I'm just going to tick through some of these statements right from the Vedanga Jyotisha, and you'll see very clearly why there's a sidereal system um, and how they measured all that out with, zodi uh, with uh, nakshatras. So again, we see in the very earliest Vedic astrological references how timekeeping was approached, how the zodiac was calculated, and how it was used to measure time and space. Solar months were connected to the seasons and solstices, but measured by the nakshatras, both in space and time. So below are a few of the important sections from the Vedanga um, Jyotish in the Krishna Yajurveda that show how the Indians measured space and time with nakshatras. So first we see that the year length and the connection of the seasons to the solstices are seen. So this is the quote from the Vedanga Jyotisha. It says, 366 days for the solar year. In the year there are six ritus or seasons and two ayanas or solstices. In the year there are 12 solar months and five years make a yuga. So right there, they're, they're talking about the time. In this handout that everyone can have, you'll see there's a section called additional material where you can get more information on the, on the seasons and solstices um, right here in the Vedas, in the Ajurveda. This is how they talked about seasons, right? There were 12 seasons. That's different than 12 zodiac signs. So they were measuring 12, but they weren't measuring 12 zodiac signs, they were measuring 12 seasons, right? Very clear, seasons are related to the calendar, zodiac is related to the sky, right? So they were measuring the 12 portions of the year, um, what you would call tropically or with the Sayana zodiac as 12 months of the year, right? Not 12 zodiac signs. Zodiac signs are, as we just saw, connected to nakshatras and the sky. The sky is the zodiac, the calendar is, is 12 months and 366 days in the year. So it was very clearly broken out. They knew exactly what they were measuring and they did it correctly. We also see that the following verses show that the new moon in Danishta, or what they called Shravishta, began the Solai lunar month of Magha at that time. It also shows that the solar calendar month Tapa and the year, Yuga, beginning on the new moon near the winter solstice. So all this stuff, again, was all correct and aligned. So here's the quote from the Vedanga Jyotisha. When the sun and moon occupy the same region of the zodiac together with the asterism Shravishta, again, that's Danishta, at the time begins the Yuga, five-year cycle, and the synodic month of Magha. And also the solar or seasonal month called Tapas, the bright fortnight of the synodic month Magga, and the northern course, Uttarayana, or the winter solstice. So it seems they celebrated the northern course on the new moon near the solstice rather than the exact Uttarayana that we um, explain now, but they clearly knew that that's when the northern course began and that it happened in Danishta Nakshatra, what we now call Danishta. We see a reference to this, as Rani and others know, in Brihat Samhita, when Varaha Mahira refers back to the time when indeed the northern course happened in Danishta, now it happens in Capricorn. Varaha Mahira, a later Indian scholar, referred back to these verses in the Yajurveda very clearly, which shows a continuity of thought that the Indians were always using these calculations and they understood what they were doing. But here you see all of this is aligned with nakshatras. So they were measuring the Seasons, the northern course, and the year, they were measuring it with the nakshatras, with the sky. Because the sky was the, is, the, is the sky, it's not the seasons, which is always processing, right? So it's these fixed points in space that were being measured with the nakshatras, okay? And so again, now we see just an implicit rule that says, where the nakshatras measure both the northern and southern course at the time of this text. So it says, when situated at the beginning of Shravista segment, the sun and moon begin to move north. When they reach the midpoint of the Aslesha segment, they begin moving south. Now they seem to be- Two minutes out of CVG. They seem to be connecting the sun and moon to start or celebrate the northern course when only the sun creates the northern course. 
but the soli lunar months begin the year, months, and the seasons, right? So they clearly understand that the northern course begins Shravishta or Danishta and the southern and uh, the northern, I'm sorry, the northern course with Danishta and the southern course with Aslesha. And then this, which we already talked about, confirms that the six seasons multiplied by four and a half asterisms equals 27 nakshatras. So four and a half asterisms is one season. So again, they're measuring the sun moving through four and a half nakshatras is one season, and there are six of those each year. So the sun moving through nakshatras measures time, not just space. They were measuring space by measuring the solstices and equinoxes and soli lunar months and measuring time with the sun moving through nakshatras. And the five-year yuga that we already mentioned as well, in the same way, the total of the asterisms of the sun is 135 in five years. So again, they measured a five-year cycle. They measured the year accurately, 366 days, and then five years was the sun moving through 27 nakshatras. And I think this is why 27 is the foundation, not 28, even though they have Abhijit. It's a portion of the 27 nakshatra time-space measurement. So even though no zodiac signs are mentioned in the Vedas, we must conclude, unless compelling evidence suggests otherwise, that the Indians would continue to measure the sky surrounding the earth with the near iron zodiac, which is the zodiac without the ionumsha or the sidereal, as we call sidereal. And indeed they did, as we see in all the major Vedic astrology texts, which I showed earlier, where you see all of the zodiac is pinned to nakshatras and the rashis and nakshatrapadas and all of that. So it's very clear. <clears throat> so this shows you why all the way back at the origin of their entire culture, everything was measured time, space, seasons in alignment with the sidereal space and time, and also understanding the calendar factors or the Sayana seasonal factors. So there you go in 10 minutes. Thank you, Sam. Always full of science, always full of facts, and always full of a way of making it all of us easy for us to digest so we can digest these facts and understand these things in a clear way. I can't thank you enough, Sada Sivaji. Um, would anyone else like to comment on the defining of the zodiac through the nakshatra before we move on? Dr. Paiji? Yeah, I think that was um, excellent, Sam, uh, you know, talking about the zodiac and also the nakshatras. Um, many people today in the sidereal system, they take up Chitra Paksha as being the most adopted form of setting for doing their uh, readings because Chitra has speaker or spika, whatever you call it, at almost 30 degrees of Virgo. That's exactly where the point where, you know, they say it's the point where Ketu actually is, it's not exalted, but it is very, very powerful at that point. And Rahu is the origin where there is no Nachat, there is no Yogatara at zero degrees of Aries. They say many of the scholars in the southern part of India, this is not written in any books, but they accept that Rahu's birth was zero degrees of Aries and Ketu's birth was 30 degrees of Chitra. And that's why you see the most brilliant star, which is Pika in the sky. But I, here I want to show you another thing that some of the modern astrologers are adopting, which can give some clues of wanting to take a different uh, nakshatra scheme for your Ayanamsha. Um, you know, if you can see here, Pushya and Revati, these are two nakshatras where, which are very, very close to the ecliptic. And there are a few researchers and scholars like uh, PVR Narasimha Rao, he has also been experimenting with the Ayanamshas of Pusha Ayanamsha and Revati Ayanamsha. Why? It's because they're very, very close. Chitra is in the declination, it's about minus two degrees from the ecliptic. But there are a few scholars who are also experimenting 
with Pushya and Revati because they're very, very close to the ecliptic. Pushya is almost there on the ecliptic. That's why you can see the Pushya or Brahaspati, what we call, is uh, said to be one of the best nakshatras because it's just on the ecliptic. This is my, uh, you know, research that I've been wanting to share with you people. You can, you know, Chitra is the most accepted Ayanamsha by most astrologers uh, because it's the center. And, you know, there are other researchers who are also researching with Pushya and Revati. Thank you for sharing that research, Dr. Pai. It is so amazing to see the options that are out there, um, to say the least. Uh, Sadasiva, quickly. Yeah, just quickly. Yeah, that's um, fantastic. And there are many different ionumptias, which is certainly another issue. And, uh, and again, the ionumptia um, would be how do we, where do we start the circle, right? And because it's space and you're trying to measure the exact portion of space, um, this has always been a sort of debatable um, issue. And in fact, the main reason I would contend now that I've researched this a lot, the main reason we have what we now call a tropical zodiac is because it's pinned to a specific event. Now, I would never say that it's wrong, but it's certainly not the space. You're actually taking the vernal equinox, which is an event that happens on Earth, and projecting that up into the sky simply so that you can have a clear point that cannot be disputed. This is actually, in many ways, the best case for the tropical zodiac itself is because then you just start that circle of space on the vernal equinox and there's no argument about it, right? Everybody can agree where that point is. Um, so in fact, in many ways, one of the reasons for people using tropical zodiac is because of that definite event, right? So, but again, it's not to say that it's wrong because it works fine, especially in Western astrology, for example, because the whole system was developed around it. But Ayanamsha as, as an issue, is the um, really trying to split that hair between that, that the, you know, we're talking about such small increments of space. And I've looked at Pushyapaksha and Chitrapaksha and all of them as well. People need to understand there's such a, it's such a slight difference that at this point, it's just one of the many things that an astrologer has to work through once they start doing their research. And the example I use is that it's kind of like a color wheel. Like if you're looking for a shade of red or blue, and you know how you move that thing ever so slightly, it's just that ever so different shade. It's kind of like that in the sky. So um, as we see, the texts are very clear that the, that the zodiac is sidereal, nakshatras and rashis aligned. And now as we get more sophisticated with spherical geometry and ways of measuring, that origin point is something that we have to um, you know, work through. So it's great that we have all of these um, you know, different ways of trying to do that. So um, that's all I wanted to say was that we shouldn't, not that, not, that, not that Dr. Pai did this by any means, but we shouldn't also mistake that because we're still working with that Ayanamsha, that it means that, that that Zodiac is somehow not as good or anything like that. It's, it's, it's tricky finding the exact lines in the sky. <laughs> We're human beings here working on a divine science. And um, uh, if you can- Dr. Pai wanted to say something. Just quickly, Dr. Dr. Pai, please. Um, yeah, uh, very quickly, I want to, uh, you, know, um, you know, what Sam said, I agree with him completely, what he's saying. And I want to tell to all my viewers and you know, all your viewers here, you can follow any form. You can follow, follow tropical, you can follow sidereal. But the traditional system that I'm, I'm talking about, I'm not talking about anything, you know, what is accepted. But I'm saying traditionally, when you're following any tropical or sidereal, you cannot, you know, forget the Kala Purusha Kundali. Kala Purusha is a cosmic man. I have seen great results coming from the sidereal Kala Purusha because you can use tropical as well, but you cannot, the underlying thing has to be sidereal. This is my view. I, I don't mean to say, you know, the tropical can't get you good results, but I'm saying the traditional astrologers always have to, you know, they have aligned themselves with the, Kalap, uh, with the Kalapurush, which means I've got brilliant results looking at uh, the system. I've not researched on tropical. I have to be very honest with it. So I can't comment on that. 
you know, there might be good results there. But I'm just saying, you cannot forget the Kala Purush Kundli. This is a big mistake you're doing if you do not follow the Kala Purush Kundli. This is my humble submission to everybody. You can follow any system, but don't forget the Kala Purush. Uh, it's yeah. aligned to the cosmic man, which is Vishnu. Beautiful, Dr. Pai, bringing the sacred back into it. One second, Sadasiva. Just, just real fast. Absolutely. And this is why it's not just a matter of following it like you're following it blindly. Yeah. What I'm trying to do, you know, what I'm showing are the texts. It's, it's not, you're not following me. You're following Brashra. You're following the Rishis. You're following the sages. And even when Shanati said earlier, you know, of course, you know, we don't have to follow the Rishis, but why would we not? Exactly. They've told us everything else. How can you say that everything else in this book is correct? And I'm following all of this, but I'm not following the calculation. I mean, again, this is, this is, this is what it is. So this is why I showed all of the, all of the statements from every text. They, they were, they knew what they were doing when they calculated the chart. There was nothing, nothing ambiguous about it. It's about the only thing that's certain it's sidereal. <laughs> so as Dr. Pai G says, that's the, that's the Kala Purusha. That's the, that's the Akash Mandal. It is sidereal in Indian astrology, never any variation. So that's, that's all it is. hundred percent. The Rishis agree. You won't find it anywhere. So there you go. You still need to have Kala Purusha in the background. You can follow any system, but you cannot, uh, you cannot forget the Kala Purusha. Because if you're forgetting the Kala Purush, then you're missing out on many of the secrets that you can get from a, uh, a chart reading. And this is from, a, from my experience, practical experience, I'm telling you. And there's also, but again, you know, I've been having some conversations with other astrologers that cross both systems, that do Vedic and Western. And there was an entire system of astrology that developed using the tropical zodiac. It began in the ninth century in Persia when they translated Tetra Biblos into Arabic. And from there, an entire system of astrology developed called Western astrology. That whole system interprets the tropical zodiac. That's what the system does. This system of Indian astrology interprets the sidereal calculation. This is why, I mean, that's what the systems are. The systems interpret the calculation. The calculations come first. The systems come later. And yeah. so this is why you didn't have that tropical astrology. And what we now have is Western astrology interprets that tropical calculation. And everything in the Vedic astrology texts begin with a sidereal calculation. That's where it starts. And everything after that interprets that calculation. So just the way it's laid out. <laughs> Great, great, great. I've always felt that certain sciences have certain tools that um, when those tools are used with those sciences, we get the most out of what the science has uh, its truth behind it. So when it comes to the, the tool of Jyotish and Vedic astrology, let us use the proper tools. And for Western astrology and tropical astrology, may, use, may they use their proper tools as well. Now, for... I, I would like to switch topics to Dayananda G, uh, if that is okay with everybody. Dayananda G, such an honor to have you here, and I would like you to please discuss the Tarabala method of using nakshatra. Great, and uh, I wanted to acknowledge Ronnie again for setting the stage in terms of talking about the qualities of the nakshatras, which is, I think, an, of course, an important part of Mahurta. Dr. Raman in his book, uh, Electional Astrology, or Mahurta, he, in chapter three, he talks about the importance of Tarabala. Uh, Tara meaning star and Bala meaning strength. And so it's looking at the, the strength of the star in relationship uh, to one's birth nakshatra. And it's the transiting moon nakshatra and the, and the connection between the two. And, um, there's three basic uses of Tarabala. One, as I mentioned, is Mahurta. The other two that I've kind of looked at, which I've had really fun playing with, is the daily activity of, of someone. When the moon, just following the moon and seeing the daily activities and what goes on during that day, because the moon basically is in a nakshatra of approximately 25 hours at a time. And then the other area I've looked at with Tarabala is relationships of comparing one's moon nakshatra to the other person's moon nakshatra and looking at Tarabala. 
you could go ahead and put the table up, Kashana T, that we worked on the other day, that would be great. Oh, that's a nice one, too. <laughs> okay, so can everybody see this? All right. This is the table that uh, uh, a friend of mine, actually one of my teaching assistants, uh, um, a woman named Myrie Masco uh, has a wonderful article, which I'll be happy to share with uh, the viewers if they're interested. Uh, but basically what we're looking at is the relationship between the transiting moon nakshatra and your uh, birth nakshatra. So for example, if the moon is transiting your particular moon nakshatra, uh, it's considered kind of hazardous to the body. Uh, we know that when the moon's in the same nakshatra as ours, we can feel an emotional, sometimes uh, strong emotional feelings when the moon is transiting. So these are the nine different transits of the, of the moon nakshatra related to your birth nakshatra. How you calculate this, of course, would just be going one by one uh, from your birth star. But if it's over 10, you divide... Uh, you divide by nine and then see the balance. So let's just say, for example, your moon nakshatra is Ashwini, and the moon is transiting through uh, the Ashwini nakshatra. This would be your Jamna nakshatra, which again is kind of a vulnerable time. The second nakshatra, Sampat, is connected with wealth or prosperity. So for example, using Ashwini again, and we looked at Varani, the second nakshatra, this would be favorable for financial gain and prosperity. Whereas the third nakshatra, third nakshatra from your birth nakshatra, Vipat, can create danger. Um, the fourth nakshatra, Kashima, connects with prosperity again. The fifth one, Pratyak, is obstacles. The sixth, Sandana, uh, is connected with the realization of ambitions. Uh, Nadan, Nadanta is dangerous, and then Mitra is good, and Parama Mitra is very good. So the idea is if you look at this, one simple way to do it is if the nakshatra from your moon nakshatra is two, four, six, eight, or nine, it's considered very favorable. Whereas if the nakshatra from your birth nakshatra is one, three, five, or seven, it's considered, considered unfavorable. One of the ways that I remember this is just a very simple cheerleader mantra, which is two, four, six, eight, who do we appreciate? Nine. <laughs> so it's one easy way to work with this. But I found that um, these nakshatras, if you follow it and just connect it with your moon nakshatra in terms of daily activity, you'll see sometimes these aspects being, uh, uh, being revealed. So at the end of the day, it's good to just memorize which nakshatras are in these positions, and you'll notice that the energy of those days will be more positive. Now granted, if it's over the, the 10th nakshatra from yours, then you have to use this system again. And so again, one of the easy ways to do that is if it's, say, if it's 11 nakshatras away from your birth nakshatra, again, is to divide by nine, and then the, uh, the balance would be two. So again, with Ashwini, if it was in the uh, uh, nakshatra of say, Magha would be one, so it would be more vulnerable, where if it was in Purva Falguni, number two, that would be more acceptable for Ashwini. The other thing that I've looked at with these nakshatra, these Tarabala, is to look at relationship compatibility using Tarabala. So again, we find that uh, uh, this is also can be used. Uh, I'll give you an example. My moon is in Aslesha. And so the ninth nakshatra from Aslesha is, uh, is uh, we're looking at uh, Anuradha. 
is the ninth nakshatra from Aslesha. And I found just in relationships with people that have their moon in Anuradha, there's a, there's a very positive connection that I have with people with moon in Anuradha. So again, counting from yours, you may find that the ninth nakshatra from you, you'll have a deep connection with these people. And again, two, four, six, eight from your moon nakshatra, you may also find this connection. Um, so those are some of the main things I wanted to say. Um, also, Dr. Raman, he mentions in his book, Maherta, that um, the 27th, the 27th and 20, uh, the 26th and 27th nakshatras from yours, or excuse me, 27 and 28 from yours are also considered very favorable because again, they would fall in the eighth, ninth. So the two nakshatras right before your nakshatra, uh, Dr. Raman considers favorable. He does mention a lot of exceptions in his book. So I would highly recommend if you're interested in Tarabala, read chapter three in Dr. Raman's book. And as I mentioned, I have a great handout that my, my Re Masco put together on Tarabala that I'll be happy to share with any of your viewers. He does mention, though, there's the exceptions. For example, if the moon is in your moon nakshatra, he says for women, that's still considered favorable for marriage. So there are these exceptions that he lists. Um, there's some other uh, activities that actually can be good when the moon is in your specific nakshatra. So those are some of the things I wanted to share. So open to questions or if there's any comments, it'd be great. Thank you, Dr. Harness, for that very comprehensive view on Tarabala. Would any of the other astrologers like to comment on the Tarabala method? It's quite profound and effective. Uh, I would love to hear some of the other astrologers' insights. Sunili Ji? Yes, this is for me. Uh, I think some voice. Uh, Tarabal is very important in uh, ruling out the particular events as per the Mahadasha or as per the planetary position also. In what nakshatra you are born, say Janma, Sampat, Vipat, Shrem, Pratari, Sadak, Vad, Mitra and Atimitra. So, if, uh, as uh, Mr. Dennis says, he is Ashlesha and Anu, Anuradha people, he is, he is finding more uh, affection or something. By the way, I, my Mars is in Anuradha Nakshatra. So, uh, what happens that whenever you meet a particular people in your life, so if not only in your chart, but in other chart also, how we do the matchmaking for a male and female, same way, for Tarabal also, you have to do the matchmaking. That in a, a, a partnership business or for matchmaking, girl and boy are same way. If you are not looking at the planets, you can just look at the Tarabal and you can just derive to the conclusion that whether these people are compatible with each other or not. Same way with common people also. For particular people, we find that no, we have some more affection or we have some more attraction, or we have some more, uh, we are finding some good things in another person, because that is the Tarabal, which is attracting each other. And with some people, even though they are very, but they are not dear to us. This is totally uh, depending on the Tarabal. And in our own uh, chart also, your Mahadasha Lord is of, this particular Tarabal, your whole uh, Mahadasha will go as per that Tarabal uh, strength only. Then uh, another uh, thing you have to see the Antardasha or Prati Antardasha, then again for that you have to see the Tarabal only. So see, Nakshatra has such a vast, uh, this. Uh, I think now Nakshatra is only uh, universe. As uh, Mr. Pai said before some time that we should not forget the Kal Purusha. So, Kala Purusha is a Vishnu only, as he said. Vishnu's navel is Antariksha. Vishnu's navel is galaxy. Okay, and Vishnu's eyes are sun and moon. So, that is the Kala Purusha chart. We are born with that only. And this Tarabal is also equally divided in all this Kala Purusha, or you can say 
Vishnu. So this is a uh, fantastic parable works very magically uh, in reading the charts also. Thank you, Sunu Lee. Um, yeah, I'll just give you another example of this, of this tarball in terms of relationship compatibility. My wife has her moon in Ashwini. And my moon, as I mentioned, is in Aslesha. So I'm ninth nakshatra from her moon. So uh, one of the ways that they talk about it is that the person will be, you know, again, your great friend. And so my wife and I have been together 30 years, and I'm her great friend, and hopefully she's my great friend. And it's interesting in the marriage uh, ceremony, the traditional marriage, marriage ceremony, I understand that the last line of the ceremony is, may we, may, may, may we always be best friends. So uh, again, I found that this is really valuable in looking at relationship compatibility, as, male, as well as daily activity, as well as setting a mahurta for a specific event. So thank you, Sunali, for sharing that. Anyone else on Tarabala? Um... Dr. Pai Ji, Dr. Pai. Yeah, uh, I think this is great, uh, Dr. Harness. You know, talked about Tarabala uh, from my own practice. What I've seen with Tarabala, two important things that I've seen with Tarabala, and with the uh, uh, Nakshatra, uh, you know, um, in terms of looking at Tarabala, what I've seen two things is look at the Mahadasha Lord at your birth. This is the most forgotten secret because the Mahadasha Lord of your, you know, the nakshatra, sorry, the nakshatra Lord of your Mahadasha at your birth. So if your moon is supposed in Nagashira, then Mars, wherever is it posited, whatever degree it is, Okay, that gives you a clue and look at the 10th nakshatra from it, which is the, you know, which comes in the fifth house, which is called as Karma nakshatra and look at the 19th nakshatra from that Mahadasha Lord because it's called Adhana nakshatra. These are two very important nakshatras in your chart that you should never forget because you might make some mistakes with those nakshatras. If you understand the secrets of nakshatras, you will understand that those are the two nakshatras that you should never do anything, you know, which will be, uh, you know, against that nakshatras. So let me repeat that. Let me repeat that. The Mahadasha Lord at your birth, which means if your moon is in Mragashira, so the Mahadasha Lord is Mars, so you start with your Vimshotri Dasha with Mars. So wherever Mars is posited in your chart, whatever degree. So let us say it is five degrees of Sagittarius. So five degrees of, um, you know, Aries, which is Ashwini Nakshatra and five degrees of um, Leo which is Maga. These two nakshatras you definitely have to really pay attention to because one is Karma nakshatra, other is Adhana nakshatra. So I feel that these two nakshatras you have to see if you can do maximum amount of your work or anything which supports the qualities or characteristics of those nakshatras, which is Ashwini and Maga with, if you're taking five degrees of Mars is at five degrees of, um, you know, Sagittarius, which is Mula. Dr. Pai, are those the nakshatras you are going to focus on in your second presentation? Um, no, I'm, I'm presenting something different in my presentation. Okay, yeah. okay, okay, okay. Um, just because I know, how much more time do you have with us, sir? Um, no, I can, I can stay here for another few minutes. It's okay. You know, Sam has something. You know, Sam, please go ahead. Please, Sam. Yeah, just very quick. Um, great presentation on Tarabala. A couple things I want to share. First, thanks for the cheer. <laughs> Two, four, six, eight. Who do we appreciate? Nine. <laughs> That's good. That's awesome. Um, there's a couple principles, and I really like to work on the principle sort of framework level as well, that Tarabala really lands. One is that these are placements in a natal chart from the moon. And the 
And the moon is the jiva, it's the consciousness, it's how it feels for us to be the conscious being that we are in this lifetime, how life feels to us. And that's just the moon itself, but when you're evaluating the taras of each of the planets from the moon within a natal chart, it's almost how easy those energies feel within your own mind and your own consciousness. And because we're experiencing everything through our consciousness, this is why we evaluate the moon in the Vimshotri Dasha scheme as the main one is because the moon is literally how life is coming into our consciousness, into our conscious field. And so Tarabala shows how, you know, even if, you know, again, we, you know, we focus on things like exalted or, you know, whatever, but even a really powerful planet, it might really deliver its results with a lot of strength in its Dasha cycle and whatnot. But something about it just doesn't feel so good while you're doing it. It might not, you know, you might feel like, you know, you're pulled in this direction and you succeed when you do it. But something about it has this kind of obstructed feeling like you always feel like you're kind of struggling with it or it requires a fight or an effort or whatever it might be. And when you peel off a layer of Tarabala, you can see that like there's just something very hidden and beautiful and and. Um, hard to get at with Tarabala. I teach this in my advanced courses, in my level two courses, and by the time we get to Tarabala, and it's been all the Parashara stuff, and it's been a lot of, you know, me sort of, you know, punishing them with all these calculations and work, we get to Tarabala, and it's just something very intuitive and easy and beautiful about Tarabala. Just, there's something about it, like when you see it, you're like, oh, that answers some very specific question about me, and some very specific, subtle energy that I would have had a very hard time understanding otherwise. So in that sense, I find it amazing. The other principle is that it reflects this principle that I'm going to describe later, which is the principle of the triplicities, which are the three nine nakshatra sections of the zodiac. And again, this only works when you have the sidereal as well. So one of the things about sidereal as well is that it aligns nine nakshatras with four rashis three times. Again, it's just very consistent and very clear. And so this concept of Tarabala, the way it's calculated is through these three triplicities like Dr. Arjun Pai just did when he talked about five degrees of this Ketu nakshatra in Sagittarius is gonna also refer to the next tri triplicity of five degrees in Aries, five degrees in Leo because there are three triplicities that line up perfectly and in perfect symmetry, and Tarabala is one way to evaluate that. And what I'm doing later also, um, you know, talks about those, but I just wanted to talk about those two things of Tarabala, which are very poignant to me. Excellent topic. Let's just spend a few more minutes on it. Uh, Dr. Harness. Yeah, thanks, Sam, for so much for those, those extra comments. That's great, great research. Uh, I just wanted to mention, if, if people do want a, a copy of that article I mentioned by Myrie Masco, just email me at dennis at dennisharness.com, and I'll be happy to send it over to you. Um, the other thing I forgot to mention is that the first nine nakshatras from your moon nakshatra will be the most powerful. They'll have 100% strength. Whereas the next segment of nine from your moon nakshatra will have like maybe 50% strength. And then the final nine from your nakshatra may have less, you know, less 20% strength, something like that. So if you can think of it that way, except as I mentioned, uh, you know, the 26th, 27th from your nakshatra, those still have powerful strength, even though they're in the last nine. So I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah, that's um, beautiful, uh, Dr. Harness. You know, what she's mentioned makes a sort of, lot of sense. And uh, in um, Nadi astrology, you know, from your natal moon, the first nine nakshatras are called as Janma nakshatras. Then the next nine nakshatras are called as, um, you know, uh, Janma, Anujanma. And the last nine nakshatras are called as Tri Janma. So Janma, Anu Janma, Tri Janma. So what does it mean? Janma means whatever is the present. The, five, the first nine nakshatras are associated with Janma, this lifetime. Anu Janma, which means it's your future. That's why you see the fifth house is your, is, is your, is your child, is your Purva Punya, because it's nine from ninth. And also it is your uh, you know, Punya Bhava. 
And the, the last nine nakshatras is called three janma, which comes from your past. Okay, so ninth house is about your past, your ancestors, your guru, your dharma, everything. So the last nine nakshatras is called three janma, which comes from your past. And more planets sitting there will represent something with those planets are trying to bring something from the past. If they're sitting in Anujanma, you know, with the second set of uh, Pariyaya or the nakshatras, then they bring something in the future. And if they're sitting in the first nine nakshatras from your Janma nakshatra, as per Nadi, they say it is com something which is present. So present, future, and past. That's the whole concept in the Nadi. Janma, Anujanma, Trijanma. Beautiful, Dr. Pai. Beautiful, Dr. Pai. Uh, any one last quick comment before we move on from Tarabola that anyone would like to share? Um, anybody? Okay, great. So, um, Dr. Pai, I know you have to go soon, so you're not going to be able to join us for the second half. So why don't we let you do your second presentation now? Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, Shanati, you know, for giving me this opportunity to present because it's already about, um, you know, midnight here. For yeah, the, the, the question that I have for you is, will you please discuss nakshatras and the lessons that they contain? Now, uh, this is uh, what I want to present today is I want to present um, something about nakshatras, which uh, I did research about three years ago. I presented it on my YouTube channel. Uh, I just wanted to show you some of the correlations with nakshatras in real life, right? So I'll just take one nakshatra to show you the example, but I can show you uh, what I've done in my YouTube channel. I've shown you the correlation with um, all the nakshatras which have just one star in them. You know, do you know what are the nakshatras which just, just represent one star? There's only one star for those nakshatras. So many of the nakshatras have two, three, four, five, you know, uh, stars associated with them. But there are only three nakshatras which have one star associated with them. And they are very, very important. So one is Ardra nakshatra, which is beetle juice, which is just one star. That nakshatra has only one star. The second one is uh, Chitra Nakshatra, which is Pika or Spika. That's only one star. And the third one is Arcturus, which is Swati Nakshatra. So these are the only three nakshatras where you see that there are only one stars associated with them. So today what I want to show to you is just one of those examples because I've already discussed this on my YouTube channel about uh, you know, um, Chitra and Swati. Because what I've seen with the uh, Swati Nakshatra, you know, the Arcturians, which is Arcturus, right? Uh, there is a very strong correlation with um, something which is extraterrestrial and something which is very creative because it's Vishwakarma, but I've also seen that. But let me just show you some bit about my research on uh, Ardra Nakshatra. And this comes from the philosophy that this nakshatra, you know, all nakshatras, you know, I want to start sharing my screen. Um, and if time permits, we'll talk about the other two nakshatras. This is the most important concept of nakshatras. As above, so below. As above, so below. Now, let me take you to um, the slide here. Beetle juice, or Alpha Orionis, it is called, you know, in the ancient text, it was called as Bahu. Ardra was called as Bahu. Bahu means shoulder. Okay? So it is situated in the shoulder of the Orion. So it is a star of power. It gives you a very active mind and helps you with ups and downs in career and also materialistic wealth and honors. So this is about, so I'm not gonna talk about Chitra and Swati because of the time limitations that we have. Let me go to just look at 
the concept of ardra and how to look you know as above so below so this is the theory of uh, the orion so the orion is you know uh, the pyramids of giza are absolutely aligned with the orion belt okay you, if you can see here we can see the three great pyramids that we say okay the uh, the pyramids of giza uh, you know khufu's pyramids khafra's pyramid and so these 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 are aligned with the orion right now this is absolutely aligned with the orion belt if you can see even the even how they are aligned the pyramids in giza now this is where we call it the shoulder of uh, the orion you know which is betelgeuse and this is another star you know beltrax or regal what we call it right now let me just go to seeing you know the cities associated with egypt and when they try to map the cities in egypt with the orion belt they found that the stars were absolutely aligned with some of the cities there so the three stars which you see al nitak you know al uh, al nilam and mintak they are all aligned with the giza they are all in one place but look at the other stars they are as they are associated with another city in egypt which is called zawat al aryan okay so they are seeing this is a kind of thing that you see exactly how the constellation is mapping onto the earth plane there are three cities which are associated with the three uh, th the three pyramids and what about betelgeuse there is regal and there is beltrax right so i've given the cities here so uh, the sirius the sirius is heliopolis it's associated with heliopolis now what is fascinating is when I did my research to show you, these were all the, uh, the cities which are associated. Now, wherever Betelgeuse is, Zawet al Aryan, there is a pyramid there exactly associated with where Betelgeuse is. It was supposed to be a glorious step pyramid. And many of the Egyptologists called it as the Lear Pyramid. Today, what is remaining here is what I'm showing you here. And surprisingly, they say this whole place is a necropolis. What is a necropolis? Is it's a cemetery, the city of the dead. The whole thing is a city of the dead. And this city, you know. Uh, as per research scientists today is a restricted military base nobody is allowed to go there there's a lot of activity happening there as a restricted military base ardra nakshatra is associated with military bases nuclear you know bases wherever nuclear activity is happening that is ardra nakshatra okay a lot of military activities ardra now here is another thing. This might interest uh, Dr. Harness. Orion constellation and the Grand Canyon village in Arizona. This is exactly where you know how we have mapped the Orion with this you know with the uh, with Arizona city, right? So we can see wherever Betelgeuse is, there's a tower of Seth, and wherever Beltrex is, there is Isis temple. This is exactly how the city is mapped. They are completely aligned with the stars. Absolutely aligned. It is baffling that you see this. And what I see, okay. So these are the three stars what we are correlating with the pyramids of Giza as well, right? And you can see this is the city of Arizona, the Grand Canyon village. Now, when you look at Rudra, which is associated, the deity associated, he is the howling Hindu god of destructive storms and thunder. 
and Seth is an Egyptian god of chaos. And this is what Dr. Togi told me once they were coming through the Grand, Grand Canyon. And exactly around this, this area, when he was traveling, there was a big storm and they had to stop their car. They had to stop their car for about half an hour to 45 minutes to, for, the, for the storm to come down and then they had to move forward. That gave me an indication that everything on this planet is kind of mapped to the stars. And everything that you see above in the sky is exactly mapped on the earth plane. So there are so many fascinating things that you can see in your research work. And you know, it is surprising to see Egyptian god of chaos and Rudra, the howling Hindu god of destructive storms and thunder, associated with Betelgeuse and exactly this point here in Arizona where there is a lot of storms which happen. So this is some research that I wanted to share with you that everything, including there was a young boy uh, in America who identified a spot in Amazon who said that was exactly the point where a lot of As Aztec and Mayan activity was happening. And he said he was just looking at the stars above and he was trying to map it onto the earth plane. So a lot of information that you can get from these stars and how our ancients have built cities and even you know continents were built around this whole concept of the stars. A lot of activity that you see when the alignment is happening, you can see some activity happening below. As well, so below. So this is something that nobody has even looked at, but I really want people to start looking at nakshatras and also looking at activity happening on the earth plane with you know, whenever the mapping of that you know, is happening at a particular season or a particular time on the earth plane. So that could give you some great clues about how the nakshatras operate. So it is not a surprise that you know Ardra is completely aligned with Rudra's energy, which is very stormy. And you know, it's it's fascinating. You can see the same thing with Arcturus, you can see with Spica, a lot of activity. The traits of the nakshatras are seen on those areas on the earth plane. So there's more research which is required. This is just you know, one thing that I did a couple of years ago, and probably this will lead to more researches by, you know, people. Thank you, Dr. Pai. You're an inspiration to me with your research. Would anyone else like to comment on something Dr. Pai said for a moment before he um, departs or before we move on to the next topic? Would anyone like to comment? I just had a quick question. Question. Am I unmuted? Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, so only those three have single stars, like for example, Rohini, which has, and Magha, which is Regulus. They're not single stars. There's, there are dual no. stars or. Yeah, Sam, there are m multiple stars for this because see, I'll tell you what the concept of what I've seen with nakshatras. Mm -hmm. They're yogacharas or they're, there are uh, nakshatra yoginis that we call. These are principal stars. And what I've seen in my research work is just to identify the stars we are looking at the other stars. It's just a map in the sky to identify the Yogatara, nothing else. So there would be three stars or four stars around that and you are identifying the Yogatara. But these are the only three nakshatras which are standing alone and there is no Yogataras. For, for example, Swati, there is no Yogatara very close to uh, within uh, that portion. So you're looking at like a 13, yeah. 20 portion. Okay. Now I understand. <clears throat> okay. Right. The nakshatras in the sky, the stars, not all the nakshatras have the energy, uh, you know, of that, uh, the potency of that uh, nakshatra. It's just that Yogatara. That's why Yogatara is a very important concept which people have not paid attention to. The other stars are just to identify the Yogatara. They are just there as a marker in the sky. That's my view. You know, I could be wrong, but there are only markers in the sky and the other stars do not have the strength. The strength comes from that Yogatara star, which is, you know, which is very, very prominent. And that is where is the abode of the deity, is the Yogatara. So when planets come very close to the Yogatara point, that's when they get additional strength. Yeah, so, and so certainly, I'm sorry, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to say that 
this is kind of what I was talking about earlier too. There are definitely a couple ways to look at this because again, as we saw even in the Vedanga Jyotisha, there were there are they're measuring space. Yeah. And I think that the space is what's rich the way I the way I read it. I read that all of it is important, but the space itself, like that section from zero Aries to thirteen twenty Aries, is the divine power and presence of the Ashwin Kumars. That's what's that's what's in that area and in that space. That's where the Ashwins come down. And again, when you look in the Rig Veda, all the hymns to the Ashwins and whatnot, it's that section of sky. Now, other sections of sky, other 13, 20 degree portions are also occupied by, as you just mentioned, one Yogatara, which certainly, you know, focuses and concentrates the energy of that nakshatra and that portion of space because as we see the nakshatras are portions of space and time they were using them in many different ways and even the term you know the nirayan chakra is a measurement of space just like the scion chakra again they're measuring the space surrounding the earth some of that space has a star in it others don't and it's very important to distinguish the sections that don't like what you're doing and it's fascinating to see how you're uh, delineating that and um, so there's a lot of ways to look at it, but I, I, just, I just wanted to ask um, about this because I actually did think that, but you know, now that you're mentioning that, for example, Mukha, let's say it's a 13, 20 degree portion of space. And within that, you have the star that we call Regulus, but there's other stars in it as well. Now I see what you're saying. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that, there was another research that we presented at the last, uh, you know, um, Sedona conference the Vedic Astrology Conference, which is hosted by Dr. Harness, on the unequal division of stars, which means not all stars are 13 degrees 20s. Some of them are six degrees 40, and some of them are one and a half times. And what are we seeing, at least in our research that we're seeing, great results coming from looking at this unequal division of stars. Right. And Dr. Harness was there, you know, he was coming and going through the presentation, Dr. Harness, what do you think about that? I mean, this was this is still under research, but I think he was there at the conference and he is a host of the conference and he had certain uh, you know uh, pointers that he gave to uh, I think Eve. Uh, Mendoza. Yeah, I was actually teaching the Jaimini workshop in the next room. <laughs> exactly, I know that. Yeah, Dr. Harness. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was really impressed. I was talking to Eve G about that and. Uh, I was really happy. I think that if I, if I was calculated right, my moon in Slesha actually gets to have some MAGA influence. <laughs> so I was I was relieved to see that there was some remedial measure due to helping my Slesha moon according to your calculations, if I had it correct. So, yeah. and anyway, Eve was so sweet to share with me some uh, for personal insights. So I I really appreciated that workshop, that intensive. Yeah, and I think all of it's possible. I'm, and, and again, some people might think that it's like a disagreement, and it's really not. All of it is there, because if we want to focus on any, you know, like you're really focusing on the yoga taras and how that makes for perhaps unequal divisions of the ecliptic. But, of course, underneath it all, there are still the equal portions of sky, because, for example, the sun is still moving through 27 nakshatras, you know, the reason I mentioned what they were doing in the Vedanga Jyotishi is because it's still basically correct today. You still measure five years by the sun going through 135 nakshatras. They, they, they had it right all the way back then. So again, there are different ways to do it. It doesn't mean that someone is right or wrong. And I appreciate, and I'd be interested to see your research as well. But thanks. It's really fascinating. So we have one more presentation before the break. Does anyone else want to comment on this uh, last topic? Neely, of course. Yeah, uh, Mr. Pai, it was uh, very good. Whenever you give any this, I <laughs> start getting new new ideas always. So what you said about particular Grand Canyon, about Arizona, what you were talking about. So maybe what I was thinking that maybe all Rahu energies are getting activated. See, all Vayu Tattva uh, Rashis are there, Zodiacs. Okay, that is Gemini and then Tula Rashi, Libra and then Aquarius. So what I think that first Ardra energy is getting more activated over there. Then maybe Swati is balancing the situation. And then Shatatarka is entering 
with the medicinal or healing properties over there that is why that arizona or particular sedona is always it, it's a spiritual place it's a very divine uh, energy over there so what i guess that there will be all three this uh, nakshatra stars uh, i cannot put it astronomically what you explain but i'm just getting a getting a vague idea that all vayu tattva energies all vayu tattva things are getting more and more activated over there thank you sunil ji dr pai quickly yeah very quickly you know um, you know sunil ji that's great and i remember dr harness telling me uh, you know sedona was also called as siddodana is it right dr harness probably you can say siddodana siddo siddhas lot of siddhas are meditated there so please dr harness please tell the rest of the audience about siddodana uh it's just interesting uh, karunamai the great saint from india she when she came to sedona she said the ancient name for sedona was sidadona the land of the rishis <laughs> and she said people from east india came down through alaska and came down into sedona and that the red rocks were shakti and the white rocks are shiva so sedona represents the marriage of shiva shakti energy excellent excellent yeah wonderful thanks dr harmons yeah wonderful um yeah, we'll have to have you back next year dr pai for the conference so we'll miss you this year this year yeah yeah this year would be you know next year definitely dr harness you know i should be there oh next great year. fantastic so any last comments before i talk a little bit about nakshatra devata this topic is very enthusiastic for me um because we are very logically rationally minded as astrologers we're very scientific we're very intellectual and we are constantly trying to analyze things from an intellectual or logical or rational perspective but one of the most beautiful things about vedic astrology and jyotish is the nakshatra devata so i want to dive into a more spiritual direction as we talk about some nakshatra devata and how these devata are more powerful than us they are more divine but they also reflect some of our lessons and some of the energies which we go through so i'm going to first start about kritika nakshatra because as sunili ji mentioned it is absolutely one of my favorite nakshatra um now let's just get this playing a few things i want to say about kritika nakshatra from a devata perspective is first i want to open up with some chanting towards the sun because we're going to be talking about lord agni we're going to be talking about lord kartikeya so i always like doing this honoring and chanting towards the surya toward the sun before i get too deep into kritika nakshatra so i apologize for my philadelphia sanskrit but i'm always going to try my best oh Zabaka suma sanka shamka shapaya mahadutin tamorim sarva papanganam pranato smidavakaram om jabaka suma sanka shamka shapaya mahadutin tamorim sarva papanganam pranato smidavakaram om jabaka suma sanka shamka shapaya mahadutin tamorim sarva papanganam pranato smidavakaram Om Ram Rim Ram Sahasraya Namaha Om Ram Rim Ram Sahasraya Namaha Om Ram Rim Ram Sahasraya Namaha Om Rim Rim Sahasraya Namaha So thank you for letting me bring Surya into this Now when we get into the ancient karmic energy of the story there is this great struggle between the demon Taraka and the great lord Kartikeya and it was prophesized that the great demon lord Taraka or as they would call him Taraka Sora 
that he would go on destroying the world, destroying everything that existed until the son of Shiva was created to kill him. Um, so basically, he had defeated Lord Indra. He had defeated everyone in the Svarga, the celestial dimension. So when you're talking about a demon, this demon Taraka is about as powerful as any demon could possibly be. Now, Lord Shiva was very devoted to his spiritual practices and could not have sexual activity with his wife Parvati. So they weren't going to be able to have children the traditional way. So Lord Agni actually tried to provoke Shiva's meditation. And when Shiva had become disturbed, Lord Agni said, Lord Shiva, we need your shukra. We need your ojas. We need your son because there's this demon who's destroying the earth and the angels and the heavens and everything. And so Lord, so Lord Shiva then gave his shukra to Lord Agni. Now Lord Agni, which represents fire, is the any type of vessel which can contain this shukra. So there is no type of vessel which can t contain this shukra. It is even said that those that were devoted to Lord Agni, they tried to take the shukra of Lord Shiva, and they all got sick, and they all got vomited. So it is really only Lugni, really only Lord Agni who contained this powerful shukra that was need to be created to destroy the demon. Now, the Parvati, the div divine wife of Lord Shiva, was infuriated that Agni and the Devas could not bear her beloved. So she wanted to have a biological child with her husband, but that was not possible. So they created Chaya, Chaya goddess, Chaya Deva, the Chaya uh, manifestation. Um, and, uh, and Parvati was so infuriated that she cursed all the wives of the devas that they would never be fertile. So Parvati was so infuriated that she could not have a child. So then the earth goddess responded, well then none of the devas, uh, you will not be able to have children. None of the devas will be able to have children. So if you can think that why we don't have gods the same way walking along the earth, the way we did during the higher yuga, it can come down to this Kritika story. Now, Lord Agni sought to deposit the Shukra into the seven Saptarishi wives. Uh, these were called the Kritika or the seven star sisters. The Saptarishis were the seven wisest men and they had virgin wives. So Lord Agni deposited the Shukra into the six separate Kritika six sisters. So there's this manifestation of the six Kritika sisters and the Shiva and the Shiva Shukra being said through all of them. So this is when Lord Kortikeya began to come out. Uh, they say that he grew up rather quickly. Uh, Parvati was the adopted mother because we know that Parvati has a very spiritual relationship with Kartikeya. Uh, but together, the six Kritika wives in Parvati nourished uh, Kartikeya. And on the seventh day of his birth, this is seven days after Kartikeya was born, he defeated the great demon Taraka. Now, after seven days at the seven, most of us can't imagine slaying a great demon at the seven years old, but let's say Kartikeya was this great demon slayer. It was his prophecy, so he slayed the demon. So he was given the title by Shiva of Skanda, the chief of the divine arma, the, t the chief of the divine army, the deva of warfare. So this is another reason why Kartikeya is called Skanda. He is the general of the divine army. You know, this is more a philosophical point on Lord Agni's manifestation through Kritika. But it said that before Agni, nothing, would, nothing existed. So um, it's part of the origin stories of that Lord Agni helped the universe to manifest. So this is very interesting for Kritika Nakshatra natives. 
uh, because the ancient Matrayani and Kataka Simhita suggest that before creation, all that existed was darkness and emptiness. There was no separation day and night. And then Sri Agni, the deva that we know as Agni, which is symbolized through fire, came out a skull of the divine Prajapati. And this divine creator began to, to materialize the universe. So we're talking about Agni and Prajapati coming into one for the whole Big Bang, for the whole universe to be able to happen. Um, now, the last thing that I wanted to say, because we only have 10 minutes and I don't want to go 10 minutes over either, because I could say much more about this. But those who have the uh, strong position in Kritika Nakshatra, they have the either potential to be Lord Kortikeya, to be Lord Agni, which is this very high, very divine energy, which is to fulfill your purpose. Now, Skanda has six heads, so there are many desires which are associated with this, with Ashwini. But if I, I mean with, uh, with um, Kritika, but if Kritika is in a good position, those desires can be positive. But we must be careful that we do not have faulty desires again. So there is this energy of desire and making sure that our desires are manifesting towards the higher manifestation. Um, the lower manifestation of desire, if you have strong Kritika Nakshatra, you could become Lord Taraka. Taraka demon, Taraka Surya. So just because you have Kritika Nakshatra doesn't mean you are Lord Kartikeya, doesn't mean that you are Lord Agni. We all have the demon, which is the Taraka inside of us. So we must slay the demon. We must fulfill our prophecy. We must fulfill our healthy desires, our healthy Kama. And this is many of the association with associated with Kritika Nakshatra. So I just wanted to show a little bit Maybe later I'll talk about a different nakshatra, but how the nakshatra devata, whichever devata is associated with nakshatra, that specific divine energy is trying to teach you a lesson, is trying to teach the individual soul a lesson. And so the divine energy of Lord Kritikeya, Lord Agni, they will be trying to teach you a lesson through Lord Kritika. Through, through Kritika Nakshatra. So you have planted in Kritika Nakshatra, you have Kritika Ascendant. It is important that you understand that these are the divine energies that are having an influence over your life. Uh, and if there's anyone else who wanna talk about Nakshatra Devata too, I would love to hear that insight before the break. Dr. Pai? Yeah, this is brilliant, uh, Shanati. I have to say this is excellent that you talked about uh, Kritika. I wanted to share something more about Agni. Um, Agni, uh, you know, this I read from, um, you know, Bipin Bihari's book it is excellently explained. Bipin Bihari was a legend. Um, late Bipin Bihari has said about uh, Kritika Nakshatri, he said, you know, Agni has two heads, he's two-faced. One of his face is looking towards the earth, another one is looking towards the heavens. And the one which is looking towards the earth, he is four-tongued. And the one which is looking towards the heavens is three-tongued. And he says the three tongues represents, you know, uh, Brahma, Vishnu, and Mahesh. The oblations that he is devouring here, the four tongue is more of dharma, artha, kama, moksha. So you're making oblations here in the fire sacrifice, which is the four tongue, you know, who is taking all the oblations, dharma, artha, kama, moksha, and he is distributing to the heavens. The other face, the three, the three, the three tongue face is distributing the oblations to the respective deities in the heavens. So he's beautifully explained the whole concept of Agni and, uh, you know, this whole concept of Kritika Nakshatra very beautifully. You know, this is what I wanted to share uh, with people because Kritika is, as per Atharva Veda, as the first nakshatra. 
that's where you know it's it's in vimshotri dasha system is ruled by sun and the rig veda the first verse of rig veda starts with agni mile purohitam which means it starts with agni agni even in agni hotra that you do you know the you know during the daytime you know you you say uh you know you you say the prayers to the sun and after sun during the sunset you say to the to agni so this is a this is beautiful that you're talking about uh, you know kritika nakshatra it's good to talk about kritika and agni hotra also talks about you know the significance of surya and agni so thank you thank you for sharing this a couple things really quick oh i'm sorry one more thing i have to share oh, about kritika oh. is that my guru amma ji has kritika in her eighth house position in her eighth house and whenever we look at the position of the sadhu we think of it in a perception of transcending the chart um but as i go through my delineation in my complexion with the chart i won't spare everyone with the complexities of it but basically that the sad guru transcends all of the diseases so normally when you see the moon in kritika you can think of someone who may suffer from some diseases but the disciples of ama they actually believe that she has transcended disease that means she can take away the hiv she can take away the aids she can wait take away the cancer she can take away the heroin addiction she can take away the cocaine addiction tobacco alcoholism addiction so the i just wanted to briefly share my guru's chart to show when we that yes we are humans working with our chart also the guru transcends the chart and they can heal the others through all of the aspects of the chart i know this might be really out there but i believe my guru has transcended her chart to be able to heal and take on the sicknesses of other of other entities um am i unmuted yeah i'm no you're good Okay, yeah, so I thought um a couple things really quick. Uh she's also my guru as you know, so maybe it's fitting. I actually had a couple things I wanted to share. I spent one about Kritika and one about the schema that you pointed out. Kritika is one of those nakshatras that falls in between two rashis. If we want to really see also a very specific manifestation again of the rashis and the nakshatras, we can look at the nakshatras that bridge two rashis. and again we see in kritika it starts in aries the last pada of aries which is fire and then comes into earth so it's the fire into the earth so this is why kritika is very much about things like um homas fire ceremonies priests what does a priest do agni was the great vedic priest as well and the great pujari people that have powerful planets in in um kritika are off, are often pujaris because you're taking the fire and you're containing it in earth and then you're offering the oblations to agni who consumes your blessings and then sends it up to heaven in the smoke of the fire pit so the literal fire pit of a vedic uh, uh, ceremony and ritual is signified and symbolized by agni it's literal fire being contained by earth which again is aries into taurus If you want to look at the lessons of all of these nakshatras that bridge two rashis, you get enormous insight into the nature of the nakshatras and of the rashis and the connections that the rashis share with each other. You can see what Aries and Taurus really have in common by examining Agni and by examining Kritika nakshatra. The other thing that you mentioned or the other principle that you discussed is the principle of understanding the story associated with the nakshatra um again we can look at you know certain things about it certain you know facets and qualities but if you want to understand the living the living expression of how that nakshatra feels to the person and motivates and um and um instigates action um then you want to understand the nature of that story so again you told the story of agni and this shows the power of transformation through that nakshatra each nakshatra has a story associated with the devata and that's the story that's influencing that planet you know that's there 
And of course, you want to look at all planets in all nakshatras. So someone has their Mars in, you know, if they have their Mars in Ardra, well, then they want to understand Lord Rudra and Shiva and that that energy will be influencing Mars um, and how their Mars is expressed. So the stories of the devatas are so important. Like you told that story and you tell it with richness and you understand the meaning and the symbology. And then you'll see all of the facets pop out of how um, we can really make that a living animated force in our life. Yes. And I feel like I could say much, so much more. I remember Morrigan has six heads. And I always say, these are the six heads of Kama. These are the six heads of desire. That means you've satisfied one head, then there's five more heads to feed. So this is something, this is just another aspect of, of the uh, Kritika Karma, but there is a lot of fulfillment to be, there's a lot to be fulfilled. Um, Suniliji, thank you, Sam. Yeah, absolutely. Suniliji? Yeah, so as we already discussed uh, Kritika Nakshatra on our YouTube channel, so, uh, yes, you are very right, the Agni Devata, so uh, in Hindu Sanskriti, we do all five sins, like marriage also, in the Sakshi of Agni only, in the witness of Agni only, the all seven teras or seven rounds and the Mangalashtak are uh, pronounced whenever marriage, uh, the Pavitra or pious, the knot is, uh, the two people are, uh, coming together, two families are coming together and when the person is leaving the earth that time also in Agni only the Agni Sanskaras are given in the symmetry. So here also Krutika Nakshatra Agni Devta plays very important role. So Agni is pa very powerful as uh, uh, Sam and um, Sapai both said about the Agni Bhutras. So whenever we are performing any home Havan that time the Agni is produced and this Agni Devta is there to bless us all. But when this Agni Devta is not in a good mood, that time we see a big fires are taking place. That time other all nakshatras or planetary combinations takes place and then we see the natural or unnatural calamities within us. One more thing about uh, the Saptarishi son, which was uh, Kartike, so, uh, as you said, is also called as a Shadanan, which is having six heads, as you said. These are, uh, these are all Shadaripus, that is six enmities within us, that is Kama, Krodha, Madha, Moha, Matsar, Maya. So we all have to keep away from all these Shadaripus to overcome uh, the all lust and all these things and then to lead a happy and good life but i know this is not uh, possible for all of us but at least we can try so uh, these all are pratikatmak so they are just representing the things to explain us that's it so kritika nakshatra all all the nakshatra deities are very important to understand it is almost 12 30 midnight over here <laughs> My question for you, Sadasiva, is, is would you please discuss the nakshatra schema matrix and its connection with the various rushis? Ah. First of all, explain to me what is nakshatra schema matrix? <laughs> okay, so what I mean by that <laughs> is that it was talked about at the beginning and, you know, I look for different situations while others were presenting to notice, again, this connection between Rashis and Nakshatras, because it's a clear, it's not, just a, it's not just a loose association, there's an intentional alignment in every Vedic astrology text. So you just want to understand this is clear and unambiguous. As we already saw, they give the clear instruction that Ashwini and Aries start the beginning, and boom, that snaps into place all of this elegant system of 27 portions of space fitting within 12 portions of space. So you wouldn't think that 12 and 27 fit very easily, but they do. 13 degree 20 second portions. And this is approximately or almost exactly the movement of the moon each day. 
quick, so inter- is- quick interruption. Ronnie just joined. Is it okay if Sam pr- does his presentation? Yeah, 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 go ahead. Fine, no problem. Okay, cool. Keep going, brother. Okay. So, again, just think about the coincidence or lack of coincidence that you have these 13 degree 20 portions and actually 27 of them related to the motion of the moon that exist coincident with 12 lunar cycles, 12 lunation cycles, 12 30 degree portions, right? They exist simultaneous and within each other, right? So you can make those measurements. And in fact, it's two and a quarter times. So what happens is that means 27 nakshatras coincide with 12 rashis. So that means you have nine nakshatras spread up, you know, spread out three times over the zodiac. Okay, so you have Aries to Cancer, you have nine nakshatras, Leo to Scorpio, you have nine nakshatras, and Sagittarius to Pisces, you have nine nakshatras. So this is what I mean the nakshatra schema, just mean the whole scheme of the nakshatras and the zodiac triplicity. So the triplicity just means three, you know, like multiplied three times. So we have nine nakshatra patterns multiplied three times. And especially when you connect the Vimshotri Dasha cycle to it, we attach planetary rulers to each one of the nakshatras, right? And that means that during a different Vimshotri nakshatra, you know, a Vimshotri Dasha, three of the nakshatras get activated because they're ruled by those planets. So one of the things I noticed is that within the, nuksh- within the zodiac schema and the zodiac triplicity of three sections of four signs, you have the first section is starts with a cardinal sign and ends with a cardinal sign, which means Aries and Cancer begin the first section of the zodiac. These are two cardinal or initiating signs. The middle section of the zodiac is two fixed signs. Leo starts it, which is a fixed sign, and Scorpio ends it, which is a fixed sign. And then the end of the zodiac, you have two dual signs. Sagittarius starts it, and Pisces ends it. So you have this, this um, also this schema of initiation, stability, and transformation. And so the different classes of nakshatra deities and the different triplicities line up in a very interesting way relative to these nakshatra rulers. So that's what I'm going to discuss, um, is how you can see in the first section of the zodiac, you have certain types of gods and deities, because again, the, the nakshatras aren't really ruled by planets, they're ruled by deities. They're activated or triggered by planets if you're using Vimshotri Dasha, but sometimes you're not. So we have to be careful and say, you know, the planets don't actually rule the nakshatras. Deities rule them and planets activate them. But we can see the strong correlation there. But um, these nakshatra deities are first from the Vedas and not from the Puranas. So again, the Vedas are the ancient text where they, you know, you know, prayed to the sky gods and prayed to all these universal transcendent energies. So that's what rules nakshatras, the deities. And they're not the deities like Shiva, Lakshmi, you know, Ganesha. They're, as we've said, Indra, Agni, Soma, Varuna, and different ones that I'm going to go over. But also many of the deities refer to Adityas. It's a class of deities which are sons of the earth mother, Aditi. And these are protective, creative nature and forces of the sun. So these Adityas, it's a whole class of deities, right? And then the other thing to understand about the nakshatra deities is they show a sort of cosmic divine temperament according to the deity's nature, which we've already talked about. Shanati did just in the last segment talking about that sort of cosmic divine nature of Agni and the deity's nature and its gentle and um, you know harsh or gentle actions are shown but we really need to understand the nakshatra as a divine temperament of that deity. So there are different gods and classes of nakshatra deities. There are the Vedic gods. And again, these, these, are, loose category, these are loose categories, which are, for example, Soma, Indra, the Ashwins, Yama, Prajapati, Brahaspati, Nirati, Rudra, Aditi, Vishnu, Indragni. These are like Vedic gods. Then there are the Adityas, which are, as I said, the sons of Aditi who is the ruler of Punarvasu. 
And those are include Bhagha, Aryaman, Savitur, Vishrakarma, Mitra, Pushan, Varuna. Those are actually called Adityas. Varuna actually goes back and forth between two, but you want to understand that these Adityas are about preserving and maintaining life on earth. And then there are certain elemental gods like Agni, which is fire, Apas, which is water, Vayu, which is wind. And then you have others like the Vishwadevas, the eight Vasus, Ahibunya, Aja Ekapad, Sarpa, the Pitris. You know, many of these are a sort of collection of different energies, different deities, or things like Maruts or Rudras or Sarpa, which is the serpent king. Pitris are the ancestors. So again, these are kind of ways to sort of categorize the deities um, so that we can explore this a little bit. So the first triplicity of the zodiac from Aries to Cancer. This shows where we're initiating creation, as there are two cardinal signs, as I said at the beginning and the end. Aries is a cardinal sign, so is Cancer at the end. So there are no Adityas there, but Aditi is introduced after Lord Rudra brings down Prajapati. So one of the things to really understand is the whole kind of story arc of creation. Um, but the first section has mainly, um, you know, you'll see the... Um, you know, the Vedic deities are there. We have the Ashwin Kumars, which starts creation, then Bharani or Yama. Um, you know, God Yama, he's also from the uh, Vedas. Then you have Agni. Then you have Prajapati. These are all deities that relate to the story arc of creation. Then you have um, Soma. Again, these are all ancient Vedic gods. Then Rudra. Then you know, whatnot. So it's mainly those Vedic deities in that first section. But what gets really fascinating is then the a second... A couple, couple more minutes. Out of the season. second triplicity is from, Sagitt is from Leo to Scorpio. So the second group where you have the two fixed signs is from Leo to Scorpio. Again, these are fixed signs. So it's literally about our life on earth. So you want to also understand that that section of the zodiac also has to do with your fixed life on earth, your stable life, wanting to live a stable life. Notice this also in the chart. Leo to Scorpio is that fixed and stable life. And we have five of the Adityas to protect and sustain the earth at that section of the zodiac. Porva Falguni, which is ruled by Bhagha, he's one of the Adityas. Um, so is Aryaman, one of the Adityas. So is Savitur, one of the Adityas. So is Vishwakarma, one of the Adityas. So that section of the, um, of the Zodiac is really populated. Actually, so is Mitra, one of the Adityas. That's, they're all, there's like six of the Adityas in that section of the Zodiac where it's about the stable life on Earth because it's that stable section between Leo and Scorpio, right? That's where we're trying to manifest a big life. But then the final one, the third triplicity from Sagittarius to Pisces have to do with transformation as there are two mutable signs at the beginning and the end. So here is where you see all these supernatural, unusual deities that combine transformative forces, elements, and energies. So this third tri triplicity between Sagittarius and Pisces is where you see the Vishwadevas, the eight Vasus, Ahibudnya, Aja Ekapada. You see all of these transformative wild deities. It's not like Agni or Soma. It's Again, Vishwa, um, it's, it's like the Vishwadevas, the universal gods. It's, um, you know, Ahibunya and Aja Ekapad, which are the two of, of, um, of Purva Bhadra and Uttar Bhadra, which are transformative. They're actually called Rudras, which have to do with destroying life and transforming, just like that section of the Zodiac. So real quick, last thing, we have those three sections of the Zodiac. One is that initiating and starting life. And again, you can understand Aries to Cancer has that quality as well. Those signs are about starting and initiating life, where life is young and hot and beginning, even sort of like adolescent, even for like from birth to like adolescence or young adulthood. Then Leo to Scorpio is from like adulthood and all the responsibilities and pressures and building a big world. That's from Leo to Scorpio. And those nakshatra deities clearly reflect that as well with all of those adityas to manifest life. And then the last part of life is transforming and evolving toward higher spiritual consciousness, which are the signs ruled by Jupiter and, and um, Saturn. 
Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius, Pisces. And those deities are dominated by these supernatural forces and not just those literal ones. So that's me trying to cover it in 10 minutes. <laughs> There's a lot to elaborate here because these stories are just fantastic. And this matrix of the nakshatras and Rashi schema, I think is fascinating. I like to say, as someone who's just been presented the matrix, thank you, Morpheus. I now am able to see the real way that things are. But in all seriousness, this is a divine architecture, what you're explaining. And it's a divine architecture, which, you know, when we look at it from the perspective of in-depth research and investigation, we can kind of see the way that divine architecture works. So again, what we call spiritual science. So I always thank Sam for provoking that type of mentality and that type of thinking. Um, I'd like to, if it's, um, unless you would like to comment on, um, would you like to comment on Sam's presentation, Ronnie? Oh, let me unmute. <laughs> there you go. So I really, yeah. So I really love the way you presented it. So can, since we're the only ones left, can, can we do this like, they do in Congress, they kind of relinquish their time so that Sam could have another five minutes because I really don't have any comments except to say um, it's fascinating and wonderful. But that's up to you. But if Sam wants to go on, I'm happy to have him continue a little bit. I mean, I, <laughs> it's up to you. Well, the only thing I would say to, to just put a bow on it, yeah, thank you, Ronnie. Yeah, and that's great. The only thing I would say, because I, I got the information out, what I what I'm aware of is, you know, I can get the information out, but it can be kind of overwhelming for people at mm -hmm. times. So one of the things that I really just wanted to kind of land and in a larger context, you know, I, I will spend an hour to teach this, but it's to really, you can go very deeply into these, not just the Rashi schema and, and as it relates to the nakshatras, but again, this implies all the elements. Again, this is why it starts with the fire, you know, it's a fire, water, air, earth sign. In each of these three zodiac mm -hmm. triplicities, you have the fire of initiation to the water of initiation. That's the first section from Aries to Cancer. Mm -hmm. Then the stable fire of Leo to Scorpio. It's that stable section of the zodiac. And we know when people have all their planets or a lot of their planets in that Leo to Scorpio section of the zodiac, that's all about manifestation. Leo is the power of the kingdom. Virgo is organizing the kingdom in the best way. Libra is sharing what you have with others. And then Scorpio is, you know, really building the most powerful structure and then transforming into the next, right? And then so that last section of the Zodiac as well is all about transformation. You, you actually have only two, two, um, ha, uh, two sign rulers in that last section. It's a Jupiter sign, Sagittarius, then two Saturn signs, then the final Jupiter sign. So that last section is all about transcendence and it starts with the mutable Jupiter, you know, Sagittarius fire sign. Again, it starts with fire and you know, it's the fire to initiate transformation because that's the dual fire of Sagittarius. Then the structure of Sagittarius, I'm sorry, the structure of Capricorn to focus and to really commit to our salvation and Aquarius to leave the world better than we found it. Then Pisces to just let it all go. Mm -hmm. So that whole last section of the Zodiac as well. You want to see the Zodiac signs and the Zodiac schema this way in general. Mm -hmm. And then you plug the nakshatras into that same schema and you see how all of these nakshatra deities support that same structure, like mm -hmm. I said. So it's just beautiful. It's one of the main things I really clicked on when I first started evaluating the relationship between nakshatras and rushis for sure. So... Well, what I always found what I always found interesting when I teach nakshatras is to even to narrow it down to say, okay, let's say you have, okay, Ashwini, Ashwini is all within, let's say, the sign of Aries, and it, it's all ruled by K2 and then Mars, um, and then you get Barani. But when you come to Kritika, then what you have is you have that crossover between right. Rashi's. So you have Kritika ruled by the Sun, but if you have Kritika 
you know, between 2640 and zero degrees of Aries, then you have the Sun Mars energy. Right. But if you get the Kritika in Taurus, you know, you get that Venus Sun energy, and and that's there is just there are just distinctions, you know, that you absolutely. Exactly. And like I said in the last segment with uh, Shanati, after he presented um, Kritika, the thing I said that I that we talked about even before we started is you have those nine nakshatras, which are the transitional nakshatras between two rashis. And so again, you see how the energy flows right. from f the energy flows first through the nakshatras, because that's the foundational matrix. And then the rashis are on top. And we interpret a lot of our worldly life through the Rashis and the house rulers and whatnot. But you can see why, how Kritika is both a part of Aries and Taurus. Again, mm -hmm. it's very clear, even, even in the symbol of Agni, which is the fire in the earth as the Pujari, you can see the qualities of Soma and the restless wandering. And even the Nakshatra Mrigashira, which is a deer, right. as being in between Taurus and Gemini, because a deer is kind of like a cow. And it's like two people restlessly running around. It's kind of a perfect symbol for both of those mm -hmm. rushes, mm -hmm. right? So one, it's very easy to start plugging into that sacred matrix and the divine and unshakable connection between Rashi and Nakshatra, also in the way that you're, um, you know, uh, describing. So it's just to really alert everyone to that whole symbiotic matrix between Rashi and Nakshatra, and especially when you start to evaluate those, those Nakshatra deities, you even see the real qualities of the deities, and especially that first section where there's, a, there's that whole story arc of creation from Aries to Cancer that plays out between Agni, you know, and then, and then Prajapati and Rohini, mm -hmm. then Rudra and Ardra, then Punarvasu, that whole story of plays out, the story arc of creation plays out through those nakshatra deities and in that section of the zodiac. Right. And so, and then the center section is about the adityas and the stability and the final is the transformation. So, right. it's, yeah. Well, thanks for the feedback. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah, when we're talking about this schema matrix, uh, universal balance or architecture, whatever, vocabulary you want to use to describe it it's the devas that are in charge and uh, that's what I'll be doing in my last presentation on but first I would like to ask you Ronnie G to discuss the influence of nakshatra for women from a classical and modern perspective if you would honor us okay so this is a little bit a little bit of a history this is kind of an interesting sort of talk because this was my master's thesis my master's thesis i translated and analyzed let me just share the screen so you get a little idea um okay let's see let's go to i'm not going to do I'll be, i'm not going to go over 10 minutes because i also have to leave but maybe i can stay for your presentation i don't want to leave in the middle um, so the, okay, so, um, basically there's a text called Vrida Yavana Jataka and Vrida Yavana Jataka is a text that actually has been translated into Hindi. So, um, the, the idea of women's astrology, there was always an astrology for women. Um, and in this text, Vrida Yavana Jataka that they kind of date till about the maybe 325 AD. They, they really don't know for sure. Um, there were two chapters, one on nakshatras for men and one on nakshatras for women. And um, Valerie Roebuck actually has translated that. If you, if you um, Google her, I think you can find it. Otherwise, I can send you the link. Um, but anyway, there are five chapters in um, what's called the Sri Jataka, Sri means women, so it's the astrology of women. There are five chapters in this text, um, and one is on the Lagna. Um, so, for instance, uh, in, in those days, if you had a, um, a Lagna that was an odd sign, or um, an odd sign meaning what we now say fire or air, Aries, Gemini, Leo, Libra, Sagittarius, um, <clears throat> Sagittarius, um, Aquarius, I think I left one out, sorry, <laughs> but <laughs> I think I left one out there. Um, but then you get the odd signs and they're very bad for women to have. 
because they're called Krura, you know, very evil and angry. Um, and then you have the even signs as Lagna, and they're supposed to be good. Uh, then you have the chapter on the moon's Rashi. The moon is good, basically, in all the signs, pretty much. And then you have the nakshatras. 61, chapter 61 are the um, houses that all the planets are in. So you get sun through the houses, moon through the houses, and then you get yogas. But chapter 60 are the nakshatras for women. Chapter 63 are the nakshatras for men. And so this is like the only text that you really find that distinction. When you move to Briyajadika, chapter 16, which is where they have the chapters on the moon's nakshatra, they are, you, it is said that they are for men and women. Um, especially as it applies to women. And sometimes you will get difficult nakshatras um, that are the same for women from the Minaraja's text and the Briyajataka, and sometimes they are different. But what I just wanted to then focus on were a couple, because there are a couple um, of nakshatras that are considered to be um, the difficult ones um, for women. Um, and I didn't redline them, but the difficult ones for women in this text that I translated are Barani, Kritika. We seem to always going back to Kritika in this, in this interesting uh, presentation today. Um, Ashlesha, Ardra, and Mula. And these are the five nakshatras that are really, really considered to be difficult for women. Now, there are some modern women's astrology texts. Some of them are very kind of, um, you know, looking like magazine texts. The other one is by um, Bibi Rahman's uh, grandfather, actually. And that is called, you know, women's astrology. It's a little book, if I can find it underneath my little papers here. I can just show you what it looks like on the cover. It's like this. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, it's called Female Horoscopy, Sri Jataka. And that's Bibi Rama's grandfather. And then you get another little book that I picked up in some store called Sri Jataka. And these are all like for women today, but they're kind of like women's magazines. But a lot of these interpretations did come from Vrita Yavana Jataka, but it was never translated into English. I, I am working with somebody now actually on translating it. Certain chapters were, but that's why a lot of people in the West have not heard of it. But if you are in India and you know, and you're, you're a Hindi speaker, the text has been translated into Hindi. It's a, it's a whole booklet on Hindi, um, Hindi. So what I wanted to also say is that I just wanted to talk about um, how astrologers, especially astrologers in our, um, you know, kind of old-fashioned type astrologers, um, talk about the nakshatras when they're looking at women's charts. Um, and when they do that, um, the point is, is that they can actually damage women a lot because um, in, you know, ancient times, obviously, they did talk about, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to get this back to um, where it was. Um, in ancient times, they did talk a lot about the fact that women had to have certain, you know, more docile temperaments and had to be more subservient to men. And so as you went on, a lot of times when you did go to astrologers and they saw that you had certain temperaments or that these nakshatras were written about in a very uh, nasty way, they would really kind of look at you very funny. And especially when you're talking about the ganas, the ganas are the temperaments and they are deva, which is, you know, kind of divine and devotional, manushya, which is human. And these have, you know, kind of like, kind of a little bit of each, you know, human is sort of like you have a little good, a little bad, because you're not, you know, aspiring to some divine force, you're, you know, being human. Um, and then you have rakshasa. And the rakshasa, nakshatras, if you literally um, talk about rakshasa, you know, and you go back to uh, Mahabharata, you know, they were the demons. And so the fact of the matter is, is that it came to be called demonic. And a lot of times if you read texts that were translated directly from the Sanskrit, they will say these are demonic temperaments. And in compatibility, which is used with the ganas, a lot of times you will find that they do not want a man, for instance, who's divine to be with a rakshasa woman, you know, because she will like eat him alive. So 
the point is, is that I think what we have to do with any ancient astrology, which is really a wonderful challenge, is to take a lot of the concepts and move them into modern terminology. So I always like, especially since I myself have a moon in a rakshasa nakshatra, um, I think that I would always tell people to look at this um, as meaning self-willed, independent. Um, it's very possible that if you're a woman or even a man, you will have um, relationship difficulties in the beginning of your life, uh, your adult life. And that's because you are independent. And you have to find the balance, I think, between how to be independent and how to also share in a relationship. What I do find a lot, interestingly enough, when I've dealt with so many clients over the years, is I find that people who have, and again, this is just, this is very general. You have to always look at the whole chart. But I also find that women and even men who have, let's say, deva nakshatras, especially from my generation, they were women who immediately thought that they had to be married or, you know, had to be with somebody in order to express themselves. And what I found was these people were more likely later in life to get divorced because they would find their voice later in life. I found that, you know, people who had more Rakshasa personalities, again, this goes to the moon, but you can also look you know, as everybody was saying, to see if you have a lot of planets in these nakshatras, you do find that that independent streak you had in the beginning of your adult life. And so you might have veered away from relationship. And then maybe you felt that you were expressive enough or you had enough self-confidence um, you know, to then share. You didn't have to just be completely self-involved. So it's just a different way. It's kind of the same energy, but it's a little bit of a different way of looking at it. And I've always felt, especially if you're a woman and you go to a traditional astrologer, even today, it's, it's very bizarre. But if you went to like some little village in India and you thought, oh, I'm going to have my chart read because it's going to really be with a great guru, he's going to sit down and he could easily say to you, oh, you'll never get married. You know, or he'll say, oh, you know, forget it. You'll never be happy in your marriage. And so these are the kind of things that I think uh, they can say to a man, but I think especially women um, are very sensitized to it. And so I think that's also um, a, an interesting balance be why the, the, this text, especially the Vridhyavana Jataka, is an interesting text because there are only these really five nakshatras that are the ones that are um, very, very, very difficult. Obviously, they're not all Rakshasa, but they are Rakshasa and, uh, as I said, Barani and Ardra. So they're going to be not, not the Deva Nakshatras at all. And I think the thing is that to, to look at, which is, you know, for me interesting, um, this would be, for instance, um, in the Briyajataka, the Barani is actually looked at as being determined, truthful, healthy, and obviously we all have, you know, good and bad. Um, but women in the text that I translated, Vridhyavana Jataka, has been really looked at as wicked, devoid of wealth. You know, these are the very literal translations from those times. And it's funny because the men's section of this ancient text also was described in difficult terms. It's only when it went on to other texts. And what you do find in Vriyajataka, um, Parashara, um, Saravali, they all have a section on women's astrology, but they do not have the nakshatras because in those texts, the nakshatras went to being men and women. What you do have in those women's sections in those texts is, for instance, um, a lot about you know women having their first menstruation. Um, you have a lot about women who um, they do the Trimshamsa chart, which they uh, they did use in India a lot for women's astrology. The Trimshamsa chart. Just a so, few minutes, uh, Ryan. And so you do get these interesting chapters on women's astrology as you went on further from Parashara onwards, but they didn't have the nakshatras for women. So the, but, but like I said, in modern magazine astrology and these texts, they have astrology for women. And it did come from this text because it was translated, it was translated into Hindi, but also a lot of people read Sanskrit 
um, anyway. But I think that Barney also, one of the reasons Barney becomes a difficult nakshatra is also because it has the um, yoni symbol. It has the female sexual organ symbol. And obviously for women, that was a very difficult thing to deal with, to have that kind of sexuality. And yet this has so much to do with transformation. And it has so much to do with also the fact that Yama, the god of death, is um, the uh, lord of that nakshatra. But it's not just death as you know it, it really is like transforming yourself into something much greater than you are. And it's also the place where Saturn is debilitated within the degrees of that um, you know, nakshatra. So I think that's one of the other difficult. And then of course going to Kritika, which we keep coming back to, um, and Kritika are the Pleiades. Um, and they are actually the seven wives of the Rishis interesting and it's also where the moon is exalted but in every text describing men and describing women you do get the um really difficult description of kritika and again that 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 whole idea that shanati um and everybody else explained but shanati did a really wonderful job you know in really really explaining the fire you know and the whole idea again of kind of the purification also because fire is um, is a, a, you know, kind of a purifying force um, where you can go from, you know, very low down to high up, you know, all the fire sacrifices and, um, and Agni, who is, um, you know, associated with the sun, which is the ruler of um, Kritika. Um, but it was the razor, you know, the, the, the symbol is the razor. It's very cutting. And this is, I think, what scared people, um, especially when it came to women, you know, to have something like that. And yet the moon is exalted there. So it's interesting. I think I'm up. I just have a few. Yeah, more. thank you. Thank you, Ronnie. Any, a lot. Any comments, Sam? <laughs> yeah, there's a couple things I um, would uh, add that um, <clears throat> the, um, you know, one, oh, I forgot, I'm forgetting now what I wanted to say. I had it. <laughs> uh, did you have something you wanted to say? Because it'll come back to me. Yeah, I just wanted to say that, you know, as I've noticed from looking at traditional text when it comes to writing about women and position in nakshatras, it can seem kind of chauvinistic or male oriented. And so I think there's a lot of room for evolution and integration. Um, uh, and I heard Eve Mendoza talk about this once, but it's trying to. Um, not take what the those old books are saying tit for tat but trying to get some deeper meaning about the karmic energy behind those things and uh and like you said there can be all these uh difficult positions for women but they can evolve through that and become these really beautiful spiritually transformative souls so uh yeah i i i think that uh that's just something I wanted to comment on. Sam, how about, did, did what Yeah, I do remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, just that Ronnie did a really good job of um, explaining the the Ghana of, you know, the Rakshasha Ghana and how it can play out for a woman. Because, you know, all of us know who do compatibility astrology that the Rakshasha temperament for the woman is the difficult one. That if a woman has a Rakshasha and a man has anything else except Rakshasha, then you get zero points in the Ghana, in the compatibility kuta called Ghana kuta. And so she did a good job explaining that. Is there a way to, to have the screen back up so it stops? Oh, sorry. Yeah, like maybe stop the share. Maybe the oh, stop yeah. share. Sorry. Like, okay, ahead, no, sorry. that's great. That's better. I feel like I can see. It. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> and so you did a great job in explaining how you know, the practical way that the, that the Rakshasha Gana plays out for women and for men. The thing mm -hmm. I always say is that the reason that it's better, you know, that it's fine if the man has a Rakshasha Gana, it's still difficult for women, but it's just more like acceptable, not just socially acceptable, but even I find that often women have a, have a kind of averse relationship with their own sort of Rakshasha nature a little bit as well. Mm -hmm. And you have to give them permission to get you know, we say, look, you're intense and dynamic and, and um, self-willed and individual, and that might interrupt your relationship. So you need to have men that are also that way who don't get scared off by that and blah, blah, blah. Exactly. So it's not just social conditioning or looking down on women. No, women themselves can often have a difficult relationship with their, with their 
you know, intense rakshasha nature. So you explained it really well that many times what might seem like a disadvantage is an advantage later because those more deva traditional types and even the um, manushas might get married really early and then as they start to grow, they leave it. Mm -hmm. Whereas the rakshasha types or the individual types are more are more independent by nature, so they don't really gravitate toward that early on so that by the time they do get married or do settle down, they've settled down a lot of that kind of rebellious quality right. and they're really ready for it. And right. by the way, so many women who are interested in astrology have the Rakshasha Gana, so you'll wind up saying it quite a bit. <laughs> Figure that. <laughs> Studying astrology is Rakshasha Gana. No. Figure that one out, right? Hard to figure. <laughs> So you did a great job explaining that. That's what I wanted to commend you on. You did. Thank you, Ronnie. So um, for my last little bit, I just want to, uh, again, focus on Nakshatra Devata for one second. So I'm just going to share my screen. Um, because we were talking about Barani, I want to focus on Barani Nakshatra. So when we get into the mythology and the history of Barani Nakshatra, um, may I do a quick Venus chant? Is that okay with both of you? Om Himakunda Manalabam Daichanam Paramam Guru Sarva Sastra Pravaktaram Vargavam pranamam yaham Bhumima kundam nalavam Daichanam paramam guru Sarva shastra pravaktaram Vargavam pranamam yaham Om dram dream dram saha shukraya namaha So, you know, Sri Yama is one of the sons of Surya. Um, but he was one of the children of Surya's original wife, Sanjana. And Sanjana could not handle the light of Surya. It was too, it was too great. So she had created uh, Chaya, Chaya, which was going to be able to handle the light of the sun. Although Chaya, uh, Devi, she didn't treat the um, biological twins of Sanjana and Surya the way she treated her normal children. She was preferential to her normal children. So she didn't treat them with exact fairness. Um, and so she gave that attention. And one time enraged in a, in, in a bit of a moment, frustrated because he never got the attention from his stepmother, thought about kicking her. But before uh, he could uh, even kick her, uh, his divine his mother had some, his stepmother had divine power, had cursed him that his foot has fallen off. Now, when this, cur when this curse began to manifest on uh, Yama at the time, it was a very spiritual transformation, to say the least. Uh, he was a human being and a child before this event happened, but what became after him of, of this became much more divine. Uh, after this, Surya knew that Chaya was not the wife, and he came to figure out what was going on. And um, he had granted that uh, Sri Visvakarma Sanjana's power, that he could limit his light for a little bit so that he could go get his wife Sanjana, so they could come back living together in happiness. When they came back together in happiness, uh, uh, Yama's father, Surya, had been a little bit uh, guilty for what had happened to Yama. So he had given him this great title. Uh, he would be known as the Deva of Death, Karma, the Judger of Souls, Lord Yama. You see, because when this curse happened to him, he became very wise. He became very wise of reincarnation. He became very wise. And so the Matsya Purana suggests that Sri Yama has trusted servants called the Yama Dutas which acts as escorts the tr um, from Earth to Lama Yoka, the celestial realm of Sri Yama. So according to the Hindu Vedas, all of us have to go to Yama Loka before we are reincarnated. 
Um, and if you are to live a particularly righteous life, if you are to live a particularly honor life, then uh, Lord Yama will come uh, for you himself on his uh, water buffalo. Um, so it, it was also said during this time that uh, Lord Yama had practiced great penance to Lord Shiva. So as you get into the karma of Lord Yama, there can be a lot of uh, judgment of the karma of our moral or moral action. Because when Lord Yama went to lift his foot at his uh, stepmother, he was instantly cursed. And this is part of the energy which eventually gave him the divine position as the one who would be the judger of all death. And by the way, the sun is exalted in this nakshatra. So it shows a profound, side, a profound side of morality of ethics. It's also called the star of constraint. So this yama vibration of the devata yama shows that the person is fair, shows that the person is refined, shows that the person is not just, their dharma, depending on the position, is to be judgmental. But that if it's an evolved version of the Barana vibration, then the judgmental should be fair. So it would be the perfect position for a fair judge. Now, it positions Aparap Barani Shakni, which is the energy of purification. So these are all our darker aspects, such as lust, uh, such as material desires, which Barani Nakshatra kinds of seeks to purify. So just like all... Um, when at the moment of our reincarnation, Lord Yama judges all of our positive and negative karma that we have gone through, gone through our life. So does the karma of Barani have us kind of mature and evolve so that we make the pro proper karmic actions? And uh, I'm not sure if there's anything else specifically I'd like to share about Barani Nakshatra. Um, and I just want to thank everyone for giving me the time to discuss uh, Bharani Nakshatra Devata. So thank you very much. Any other insights on Bharani, perhaps? Yeah, I definitely see it as very well described by you. And again, one thing I want to mention, and I forgot to mention it earlier, is that and I can't believe I forgot to mention it, but in the Vedanga Jyotisha, the names of the day of the nakshatras were inseparable from the lords. So for example, they would call Barani by Yama. They would call Aslesha by Sarpa. They would call, they literally called them the same name. It was the same name. So again, there's an absolute indelible connection from the Vedas to the nakshatras. It's not even a, it's not even a correlation it is the thing that's exactly what they're saying because it's one of the vedas it's in the vedas the krishna yajur veda from the vedanga jyotisha they're literally saying yama they're saying this section is yama this section is they you know they call prajapati rohini or i'm sorry they call rohini prajapati so they use the names interchangeably okay so again of course in this case it's yama so literally that section of sky is yama and then it the nakshatra of Bharani. So this quality of Yama, again, it's inseparable from that energy. And it's about restraint. And the way I always explain it is the first section of Aries, of course, it's in, this, it's in the same section of sky as sidereal Aries. First one is Ashwini, where yeah. we, you know, the zodiac, we hit the ground running with, with like two horses, both running. And the thing I always say with Ashwini is you need to get the horses running in the same direction. That's why you yoke the animals together. Otherwise, you can have two horses running in different directions and just waste all of your energy, which is that quality of Aries. But the next nakshatra is Barani, which is related to Yama, which shows the need for restraint. And it shows, and it shows the results of your energy. It shows the results of how those horses are running. You'll get a result. And that result will be something that is a restraint in one way or another. Even if you get what you want, now you have to take care of it. Now it's, a, now it's going to restrain you. Just like you have sex and it produces a result and now you have a baby you need to take care of. I, so I, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to ask you, I always thought it was interesting that um, young, um, 
Yama um, when he raised his foot to kick Chaya that he didn't even kick her, but he was still cursed for even the idea of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, I don't, uh, yeah, and you know, it could very well be about the samskaras in the mind because karma is in the mind. And maybe he was, maybe he was given a certain curse, even though he just had the thought, what if he would have followed through on the action? Maybe he would have been completely annihilated. So we can also see things from our point of view, you know, Alma talks about these things a lot. What might look like a bad accident was actually very much a blessing. Without God's grace, it could have been much worse. We had the Notre Dame fire in the cathedral. Terrible thing, right? Well, yeah, that could have been a lot worse. No one died. We could have been a total loss, you know? Yeah. So those qualities, just real quick to finish, of Barani and showing the results of our actions and how they produce a result that is a restraint that we now have to manage and take care of. And, and again, it's, it's like a burden also. So these are all the qualities that I attribute to Barney, like bearing. It's literally like bearing, a yeah. burden, childbirth. That bearing is what Yama brings and what that nakshatra is about. Um, and being careful to not get into punishing behaviors as well. This is another negative side of that nakshatra itself is the punishment part. Because again, one of the things is there's also the, there's always the literal story, but then there's also the feeling. This is how I really work with nakshatras is what's the feeling of that? What's the feeling of that story besides just the literal yeah. content? But the feeling is I'm not getting enough. I'm going to get revenge. Now I'm being punished. And this whole feeling is what can happen in Barney because again, it's very much, very much about the mind. And yeah. so a person with planets in Barney can often feel punished. And they can also feel like things are unfair and want to punish others. This is a big thing that people with planets in Barney need to watch out for is this desire to punish and settle the score and, and sort of get back and say, well, you have it coming to you. That's, that's the kind of negative quality. And, and, and also just on the other side of the spectrum, he was ex exclaimed by the divine to be the Lord of death. So he was given quite a great hierarchy. Um, it, it might not have been his original intention, but he uh, he did reach um, a very high spiritual place and hierarchy as far as the devas. Exactly. Yeah, and that's the and and again, but think of how it works though. The devas, all of these are playing out in our own consciousness. These are all we're the devas. We're the these are our these are our conscious energies. So when someone has planets there, they're going to feel like this is my power. I'm the, I'm the deva of punishment. I'm the deva that gets to decide what you deserve. Because that's literally what Yama is. He shows up at the time of death and takes the soul where it's supposed to go. So that's the energy. And again, it's when someone has planets there, it's often like, you did this thing, I get to decide your punishment. Like, I get to... Yeah, yeah that's why that, I said it would be good for a judge. It, it, yeah, it certainly can be, for sure. Or it, it, a person is going to be a judge... They're going to have that quality to feel like it's up to them to decide. And again, every nakshatra or every energy has a positive and a negative. The positive is someone can be very merciful because they've suffered and they know what it's like to be punished. They're very merciful to those who are suffering and very, and very humble in that way. If yeah. not, like for example, Saturn is debilitated there. Now this gets to be tricky because now you've got to plant it in really bad dignity in this nakshatra. And this is why this is where the negative qualities can come out very easily where someone wants to be vindictive and get back at you because yeah. of the negative qualities of the nakshatra. We get some interesting characters in there with Jack Nicholson, Saddam Hussein, and Sigmund Freud. And on, uh, that's from the sun. And on the moon side, you got Carl Jung, Karl Marx, Castaneda, Elton John, Meryl Streep, Lindsay Lohan, and uh, Ronald Reagan. So you're really getting a lot of interesting energy there going on. <laughs> yeah. So you did a great job, though. It was great to hear. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time. May all of you enjoy the rest of your weekend. Looking forward to the next summit. And did Ronnie have anything to say about Bonnerney? Oh, hold on. One second. Ronnie? Ronnie, I can't hear your audio said it already in terms of the fact that I thought it was kind of interesting, you know, that Barney has this like really 
kind of positive manifestation, you know, when it came to men and then very, very different when it came to women. And, and I think that whole idea of the debilitation of Saturn and the sexuality and the transformation of Barney is so important, you know, it's ruled by Venus and it's, 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 I think, I think it's like that balance between restraint and that balance between the whole idea of sexuality. And I think it's difficult in a woman's chart sometimes or very traditionally because of that line that they have to tow, um, you know, with sexuality and, you know, do they go, you know, do, does the sexuality control them or can they control their sexuality? I mean, listen, men have the same issues, of course, but I think that um, that was one of the reasons it was so negatively portrayed for women. But I think that for men and women, that whole idea of restraint, sexual restraint versus um, sexual enjoyment and how I think that's such an important um, motif. Um, yeah, yeah. If I could say real quick, and this is why, literally, it's not just the it's not just the vagina, the opening. It's the creative thing that's going to it's going to produce a baby. And the, the and the reason it's different for women is men can do it and not make right. a baby. Women do it, and now they bear the thing. They, they have bear to. it. Mm -hmm. It's literally the same word. Barney mm -hmm. is the same word that comes from barren. You have to bear the result of your actions. So it's the most it's the most fertile and visceral um, symbol that you could imagine is that mm -hmm. your actions create a result. It gives birth to something. And right. what, what better way to symbolize the birth than the uterus and the whole female reproductive system. And so this one's gonna have a different meaning for a man than for a woman because women have to bear the brunt and bear the result of literally the child mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. life is created. Right. So it's a very powerful and, and fertile symbol for sure. Yeah, uh, yeah, for a man, it's more like but 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 Benny and the Jets, <laughs> because you're get you're getting out and John, you're getting that creative ability manifesting for the individual through his maybe expression, artistic abilities versus more of the physical side of the giving birth as a mother. And it also shows a lot of that mastery. And again, because it's a it's. The, the, you know, the fierceness, it's not just to create like, oh, I'm so happy to create. I would bet Elton John's Barney is the punishing part where he punishes himself to get the most out of who he is. You know, being a great artist or a great anything takes a lot of work. Mm -hmm. You can have an interest in something, but it becomes, you become a master of it because you work hard at it. And again, this is Barney. It's, it can be kind of punishing in some ways, even self-punishing, but that can be a good thing because that leads to discipline and self-mastery. So again, it has that cruelty to it. But again, we're, if, if we keep the cruelty to ourself, then we can create something amazing. If we dump the cruelty onto others, <laughs> then we create a lot of problems. So I think maybe that, that severe part of Bonnerny can create an artist, it can create a great individual, but yeah. it's, gonna, it's gonna bring a lot of you know, pressure and stress for sure. It's that yeah. kind of stressful thing. That's why it's such a complex nakshatra, you know? Yeah. But, yeah. Um, Anyway, I have to go. I think we all have to go. But Shanati, thank you so much. Sam, thank you so much. Thank yeah. you to everybody. But Shanati, for arranging this, um, it was a beautiful four hours. I learned so much myself from everybody, which is, you know, always the, the goal, you know, to always learn from each other. So, right. um, yeah, thank you all very much. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you, Sadasiva. Thank you, Ronnie. Thank you, Dr. Pai. Thank you, Dr. Harness. Thank you, Sunili Jenny Power. And thank, thank you, Shanati, for sure. Okay. We're all family in my heart. See you in Sedona, if not earlier, <laughs> in person in Sedona. And I hope to all the viewers that you'll enjoy as you'll join us on the Retrograde Summit and Dasha Summit, which are coming up later this summer. Okay. okay. Bye. Om Namah Shivaya. Bye.